Adrian N. Breitfelder, City Clerk, you are hereby directed to call a special session of the City Council to be held on Wednesday, March 22nd, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. in the historic Federal Building for the purpose of conducting public hearings on certain fiscal year 24 department budgets. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to a special session of the Dubuque City Council for March 22nd, 2023. As a reminder to our participants, you can provide in-person input or virtual audio and written input during tonight's public hearings. Input options during the live meeting include in-person attendees may approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any public input for the public hearing they would like to speak to. Remote attendees can log in to GoToMeeting using the login links, phone numbers, and access code that appear on the broadcast and live stream and posted on the front page of the meeting agenda. This option includes audio input and written chat input. If you are participating via computer, indicate which public hearing you would like to speak to in the chat function or note that you would like to speak during the appropriate section. If you are participating via phone, indicate which public hearing you would like to speak to during the appropriate section. All comments, whether in person or virtual, must be accompanied by a name and address. Additionally, written public input is accepted by contacting the City Council directly from the City's webpage at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts and through the City Clerk's Office email at ctyclerk at cityofdubuque.org. This information will be reiterated during the meeting. Attendance for the session is as follows. Mayor Kavanaugh? Here. Council Members Farber? Here. Jones? Here. Resnick? Here. Roussel? Here. Sprank? Here. Weppel? Here. And City Manager Van Milligan? Here. Thank you. We will move on to our fiscal year 2024 department budget public hearings. Mayor Kavanaugh, I will turn it over to you. All right. Thank you very much, Adrian. The party continues, everybody. Here we are. One more night. Some great presentations ahead of us. I'm happy to welcome Marie back to the stage here to be able to talk a little bit more. So um, thank you very much, everybody. Looking forward to presentations. Our first one tonight is Five Flags Civic Center. So Marie, you can take it away. Great. Thank you. Hi, my name is Marie Ware. I'm Leisure Services Manager for the City of Dubuque. And this is my second night of budget presentation, so I think I get the award for that. You, you do, absolutely, yeah. Um, so this is the Five Flags Civic Center. Um, we do have the Civic Center Commission. Um, and as you're aware, over the last number of years, the Civic Center Commission has been an extremely active commission for us. Um, they have done the work um, and a lot of extra meetings and a lot of extra commitment to be able to bring to you what ended up to be a project that we'll talk about tonight. Um, they are very thankful for your support of the project. They have been very vocal that something needed to happen. And so, although they would have liked to have seen other things, they're very excited for what's proposed this evening. I did want to point out um, our chairperson, Rod Bakke. Um, he was talking the other uh, day at the Civic Center Commission meeting that it was his 40th year of serving on commissions. Oh. And um, so today we called the uh, city clerk's office and on 621-82 he was appointed the Cable TV Commission and on 7185 to the Civic Center Commission. So it's outstanding service for one of our commission members that's uh, listed. And that is not to say that the others are not really important, but that's a real milestone for someone in service to our city. So um, a shout out for him and for all the work of the commission. When it comes to the Five Flags Civic Center, it is uh, managed on a day-to-day -day basis by ASM Global. They take care of the day-to-day -day operations, and then they operate the facility using a benchmark, and that's per the agreement that we have with them. Um, that benchmark can, uh, takes care of the day-to-day -day operations, the general repairs, the maintenance for the facility. On the other side of the screen, it shows that the city of Dubuque takes care of the operations oversight, which is myself. We own the building as a city. The capital improvements for that building are ours to take care of, and then we provide the operating costs through that benchmark that's set in that agreement. Aaron Rainey is the general manager, and so uh, Five Flags Civic Center has seen a number of changes over this last year. Aaron took over as the general manager in December of 22, and we thank H.R. Cook for his prior service in that regard as the general manager. Additionally, there's been uh, one retirement, Dan Holtkamp, who was the technical manager, just retired after 40 years of service. 
And that meant that uh, Dan and then also a cohort of his, Bob Richardson, who is the maintenance manager, he's going to be retiring in April with 30 years of service. Both of those individuals were city employees, and when, when it went to private management, moved over to that, and then um, have stuck with ASM Global during that time. So we thank them also for their service. That meant that they've also been hiring some different positions. So we have J.R. Cook as the new director of operations, which was Aaron's title and what he used to do prior to being the general manager. And they have a new marketing manager of Kai Shireman. So really exciting things and a really almost a brand new team that are really helping to run the Five Flag Civic Center. ASM Global started the management um, with uh, that facility in 2004. When it comes to equity and thinking about Five Flag Civic Center, one of the things that um, really I've uh, thought about this last year is they bring in a lot of different excellent performers. Um, and it's performers sometimes that are athletic and sometimes that are musical or have other uh, talents in that way. Um, one of the neat things that really has happened this last um, year is to see uh, several different things where they've been showcasing talents of persons of color. And that's really neat to see when you uh, see them in those leadership roles and, and that's really nice for our families uh, that live within this community and the kids that live within this community. So you see uh, Chapel Heart there, which is country music, um, which was uh, in the theater um, on February 11th, as well as the Harlem Globetrotters, which were here, I think, just in the last week. And those are just two examples. Additionally, in other highlights at Five Flags this year, we had the Doc Dogs uh, World Competition. And this year, the dog Sounders jumped nine feet in an extreme vertical jump. Now, this is a dog, nine feet in the air and set the world record here at Five Flags Civic Center. And so that's pretty awesome. And for those that got to see that, that's a special moment. Um, also, uh, they have a lot of different events that um, do happen there, REO Speedwagon, Cirque Music, Holiday Wonderland, um, also comedians, so uh, Charlie Barron's was there, um, which a lot of people know because he's more of a local, local area regional talent, um, and so that makes for a great show. Um, and then there's a lot of children's performances. So. Um, at children and families is what I would call it. So Disney Junior Live, um, Baby Shark, for those of you that um, are in, have people that are young ones that are in that age, Blippi the Musical, Dragons and Musical Beasts, and coming up here will be the Shrine Circus here real soon. And then also Cody Jenks was uh, one of the um, persons that played there. Cody Jenks and that particularly concert um, they had a crowd of 3,681 people, 85,000 in food and beverage on one night, in one short night. Largest attendance uh, by that uh, particular concert. Next, uh, the last one that was that big um, was Willie Nelson in 2018. So it's been a while and, and that's a pretty, uh, pretty neat deal. So, um, and then there's also pictured there a country singer of Dustin Lynch. So I showcase all of these to show just the difference because some people like country, some people like rock, some, you know, we have kids' performances. So there's a whole lot of different things that do happen at the Civic Center. As I said, we work um, with ASM Global and we um, set that budget. It's set through the agreement. The dollar amount is set. And their goal is to always come under that benchmark. Um, being able to make it a more profitable facility than, than uh, what uh, the agreement says. So in fiscal year 22, uh, that's the last uh, number on the left-hand side, uh, ASM Global beat the benchmark, um, and so they beat it by $130,933, so basically $131,000. And the way this works is that when they do that, they earn 50% of that benchmark, but we get to keep it. So in other words, our taxpayers were saved by that $65,446 um, by having a private management firm being able to look at this. Um, 
Part of the reason for that is because of a lot of the great things that happened. They had a Battle of Bluff Rodeo, they had Doc Dogs, they had King and Country, and several of the other performers that I was talking about that really um, made a very successful year uh, for Five Flag Civic Center. Additionally, to make it very successful financially, uh, they work with a lot of partnerships and sponsorships. So what you see on the screen here are different partners that they have mm -hmm. that pay some sort of um, either trade and or um, they also pay a sponsorship. And that goes to that bottom line that we're we just talked about. Um, the tax support is shown here, kind of shows how um, it changes each year. Um, as you see the last number of years, of course, we had the COVID year, we had a polar vortex, so we had a couple of them that had high blips um, in those years. But we also have done in the last number of years, um, we've really focused since about 2018 on making sure that we had equipment replacement. So there's the benchmark, and then the equipment replacement sits outside of that. So it's things that we need to replace because it's the end of life cycles. And so, um, as an example, in our 24 budget request, we have $193,000 of equipment replacements that are there. And those are things like in, in this particular request that are new spotlights. So, you know, when there's a concert, being able to put those spotlights on the different performers or um, whatever the event or activity is. Replacement of some red stackable chairs. If you've ever been to something at Five Flags, you'll remember the red chairs. They've been there a very long time. So this is the last piece of replacement of the old, 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 old chairs that really have no more padding on them. Um, and then arena theatrical lighting. So this is very important. It's a very important part of what we do is replacing things to make sure we can continue to make this a good facility. All of this means that the average taxpayer um, is putting in about $19.13 a year in order to be able to um, support the Five Flags Civic Center. The City Council set a, a high priority and has for quite a number of years before this, but for the last number of years, you've said Five Flags, we've got to figure out what to do. Um, and we've gone through a lot of things and you've heard a lot of presentations, so I don't need to tell you more than um, your last action was to be able to say, let's take that, um, that money from the parking garage that we won't build at this time and reallocate it. So tonight um, and tomorrow night will be your actions to actually make that reallocation of approximately $24 million to go towards a renovation um, in the Five Flags Civic Center. The timing of that, because a lot of people have asked, they're like, how soon would this happen? Um, a big project like this takes a little bit of time. And uh, so what we have proposed doing is that in fiscal year 23, which there's only so much time left, and fiscal year 24, we would do the RFP for the architectural services and engineering services that it would take to be able to do this. Get a firm on, really start that design in F the end of FY24 um, into 25. Um, being able to look at the design, the bidding, and initial construction during 24-25. So whatever that project ends up to be, which will be back here at your table as well, um, then we would have those decisions at that time and finishing up that construction by FY25 and FY26. Um, and so um, when we did this, we also have said, We'll look at keeping one portion of Five Flags open while we do it, but that would be decided, decided during the design phase. So in other words, could we still have programs going on in the theater while other things are happening um, in other areas or vice versa? And so um, that will be determined as we go through those designs. The building improvements then, that $24 million, there is a little bit of funding that's in FY23 right now to begin the design process. And then, as you see, it's spaced out, but that spacing works well with what I just said. So basically, it'll come online, it'll be available as we need it as we're going along in this project. When it comes to performance measures, uh, one of the performance measures that we do measure with Five Flag Civic Center is about arts and cultural programming within the facility. And so this last year, we saw an increase of 2% in FY22 
for the performing arts programming held at Five Flags Civic Center. So with that, if you have any questions, although I think you do your public hearing first, right? What's that? You do the public hearing first and we then do, questions. Yep, we'll do it, and then we'll come to there questions. There we go. Yes, thank All you. Right. And I'll try to um, do everything I can without uh, having baby shark in my head, so thanks a lot for saying that out loud. <laughs> So we are in a public hearing to consider the Five Flags Civic Center fiscal year budget for 24. Do we have any public comment on this? All right, seeing none here, do we have any? No virtual. No virtual? And no input received. All right, thank you. Back to the table then for any questions or discussion. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Mr. Jones. Let me just say it sure feels good to finally have a plan. <laughs> Indeed. We've Indeed. been throwing darts for a long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a long journey to get here, but we got here. So that's the important thing. Well, and there was so much heavy lifting for, for you and for the entire team, especially, you know, at Five Flags, like you mentioned, the commission. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this has been something that, you know, a lot of people have, um, I don't think everybody realizes just how much has already been put into making this happen and making a plan a reality. Um, you know, whatever plan we chose to move forward with was gonna make some people happy and some people not so happy. Um, but I think we've, we've found a good middle ground that we can at least move something forward. And it's exciting to see that we don't have to talk about what we're gonna do, we can talk about doing it now. So thank you very much for your work. And I, I know Aaron's here, thank you very much to you and your team as well. Uh, yeah, Mr. Resnick. Uh, thank you very much. So um, you mentioned that they're very community-minded there. Yeah, could you tell me some of the community events? They used to have Taste of the World and other things. Uh, just a smattering. Um, uh, some people say, well, you know, we're paying uh, tax money, but we're never able to use it because there are no open free events. But there are. What, what are some of the things that? Uh, one that comes to mind, uh, I know that some of the JDIF, um, the, oh dear, i got to remember what it is. Julian Dubuque. Julian Dubuque International Film Festival. There we go. Um, anyway, uh, I know that some of those things are, are paying programs, but I also know that they have done a number of uh, free showings at the Five Flag Civic Center, so that's uh, one of the things. The Toys for Tots giveaway, um, that's a huge one. And, um, you know, if you've ever been there, it kind of fills the place when they do that. Um, and so that's another one. Um, let's see. Aaron, what else am I forgetting? You know, put me on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how's that for two? <laughs> That's two, and, and, and they are open-minded about uh, continuing to do that, right? Yeah. Because uh, uh, that's important that it is a community place. Uh, and uh, the other thing that I think is interesting and, and should be, I think, uh, emphasized is that the Civic Center supports the historic theater. That if they, we didn't have that Civic Center with the events moving things along, you know, a lot of Dubuqueers love that historic theater. They've got, you know, a lot of memories and a lot of great things still happen there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know there's going to be renovations. That's going to be part of it. So um, when I mentioned the citizens, um, again, they love the theater and they want to keep that going so that uh, they say, mm, oh, I guess we do need the Civic Center. You know, even though if they don't go, I don't like country music or whatever they say, there are reasons to go to the Civic Center. And even if you don't go to the events, uh, which there's a variety of those, that that facility supports this historic theater, which so many Dubuqueers love. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and that's, um, it's such an important asset when it comes to that. And when we did the studies, one of the things that was looked at is if, you know, because some people had said, you know, hey, just tear down the Civic Center part and leave the theater part because we love that part. Um, it would be much more expensive to run just the theater by itself. You really kind of need that anchor in order to be able to help with it because the theater is a more expensive part of the whole complex in the operational side of things. And so um, actually one helps to float the other one. And the theater is the one that actually is the more costly one when it comes down to it. So, um, so the... Uh, Symbiotic nature of both is really, really important. Um, as well as it also gives you those other spaces of the pre-preparation, the pre-party before you go in, the pre-events that you can have, um, things like that. So um, very important, but you're right. Um, and, it, and that came through in like the surveys, how important that theater is to people um, because it has that connection to us and our history. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Ms. Farber. Yes, thank you. And um, Uri, thank you for um, the plan. And, and uh, I echo the, um, the longstanding time it has taken us to kind of move this forward. Um, and I see the building as an anchor for Main Street and for the Main Street corridor as we're working on that streetscape and we're working on refreshing and energizing um, both the business and residential area for everyone. And it's going to be a nice tie into the Dubuque Museum of Art for the cultural wing, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, I do have a question about the historic preservation and the restoration of the theater. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that you had your um, dollars uh, for the projects over those five years. Um, are we working in parallel with hopefully the DSOL, you know, the Symphony League? Are they um, helping with some of the fundraising for some of the restoration of some of the part of, of that building? Um, you know, in uh, previous times as we did the studies, um, we absolutely have talked to them mm -hmm. about those opportunities. And then, you know, really as we start getting into the nitty gritty of the, of the reality of the project and those kinds of things, I absolutely see that we'll sit down and talk with them, um, sit down and talk with, you know, just about anybody who's interested in being able to do that. Um, there's always this opportunities to think about the naming and those kinds of things as well. And so um, each of those will come within these next steps that we take. It was, because when you start to think about it, you have to have the project and know what you're talking about in order to have people even be interested sure. in what that is, right? right. Um, and or, well, we might not be able to afford this, but could somebody fundraise for this particular thing? Because with 24 million, you can't do everything. And so there may be some things where it makes sense that someone would say that. Um, but that would definitely be, you know, the private sector to be able to do that, not necessarily, you know, within mine. So it would take some leadership on whether it's um, an organization or whether it's individuals that, just like when they rallied to be able to um, redo the actual theater itself. Um, and mm -hmm. so, uh, so that's always an opportunity. <clears throat> right, and that's always a gift to have a public-private partnership, I think, in the city, and that gives mm -hmm. community involvement, mm -hmm. and you get a lot of stakeholders with high interests. So I look forward to that stage as well. So thank you again. Yeah, thank, thank you. you, Mr. Mayor. Ms. Wethel. I really appreciated the opportunity to tour with you um, when we were going through these stages, and as somebody who is newer to council, I hadn't had that opportunity before. I had seen it from the audience in different ways, um, both the historic theater and Five Flags. But I had this picture in my mind that all we really needed to do was remodel Five Flags. And that tour really helped me to understand that our city wants to invest in historic infrastructure of that historic theater. And I think it's another example of how our city is committed to historic preservation in order to really, so much we saw from that stage. I remember looking up and thinking, my goodness, this is so beautiful and we can't let it waste away. Mm -hmm. And it's time, mm -hmm. it's clearly time. There's so much to be done there as well. So thank you for all of your direction and helping us to understand that and, and that tour was valuable for me. Thanks, and that's another important point about the equity. When we talk about equitable, equitable community of choice, um, that theater is not accessible, and and that's a sad thing. Um, and we have a certain, you know, group of aging folks, but we also have individuals that have a little more difficulty getting around or whatever. And those are really, really, really important things for us to address as we go through this process. And that's always been on our radar screen since the beginning. So um, you know that those kinds of things are also very important in this. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Marie. We appreciate that discussion. So we will close out that public hearing and move on to the Grand River Center next. And I'm assuming you're just going to... I'm rolling right, right through. And it feels a little like deja vu here for us. You know, we were all just here doing this a few days ago. So uh, take it away. I had my practice run a couple That's right. weeks ago. Uh, all right. So uh, once again, I'm Marie Ware. I'm the Leisure Services Manager. And this is the Grand River Center's presentation. The Grand River Center, um, we did a quick rework of this uh, uh, presentation now with our uh, management agreement just being freshly inked. Uh, so the city of Dubuque is in charge of the operations oversight, the building because we own the building, the capital improvement funding because we own the building, and then also the property and general liability insurance all fall to us. And then as we um, start forward, 
then the day-to-day -day operations will be with OVG. When we talk about equitable community of choice and when you look at the Grand River Center, I thought this year would be fun to highlight something that's been happening there for quite a long time and that's the Special Olympics. They have a lot, they have this great event that they hold there. They use the escalators and they come down and, and um, just it's a heart, heartwarming event. It's a yearly event that's very special for absolutely every person that comes to the facility enjoys it, enjoys a dance, enjoys lots of different activities and things. Then this year, Hope Church, and um, with the funding from the Tim Tebow Foundation, was able to provide a new event, and it was called The Night to Shine. And it was, uh, if any of you saw the article in the newspaper, it just, it's really heartwarming to be able to have a facility that can host um, an event that makes such a special, special night for very, very special people in our community. Um, and so um, those are two things I thought that were really important to kind of talk about and share tonight that are, a lot of people may not even know they happen there because if you're not there that night, you probably had no idea that that happens, but it makes for a very special evening. So we have a lot of special things like weddings and, and reunions and 50th anniversaries and whatever, but we also do some other special events that are really neat. When it comes to highlights, um, there's a lot of different conferences that happen, but there's also a lot of um, expos and a lot of different shows, com consumer shows that happen at the um, Grand River Center. So um, in the picture you see, the it's from the 2023 Dubuque Bridal Expo. So there's um, local events, uh, locally uh, sponsored events, but then there's also like sustainability conference, which we are the ones that, um, host that, but also all the meetings and conventions that, that uh, we're known for. You asked about community events and fundraisers. I actually had the slide in this one. Um, and so the Grand River Center is also one that has um, community events that are a part of it. So this year, um, just as showing um, a couple things, there was the Dubuque Brew Fest, which benefited research um, for the kids and Camp Albrecht Acres. And then also just recently, there was an opening doors trivia night um, as a, a, a fundraiser and a, and a gathering. And a number of other organizations, you could go down the list of quite a few that actually hold their um, fundraisers at the Grand River Center. Uh, so as you're aware, just because we did it Monday night, um, you had identified Grand River Center's future operations as one of your um, council high priorities. And so we went through the process of um, being able to look at the operations, put out the RFP, and then also present to you an agreement that was approved. And so OVG 360 um, is your new venue um, manager uh, starting on March 31st. Uh, and so we're excited to be able to do that and they're very actively working towards that and at the Grand River Center as we speak. Um, so the way the budget works, and I kind of explained this the other night, but if you look at the current budget in your policy book, it shows these line items, and I talked about them the other night. These are the line items of expenses that year after year we have money. The dollar amount may change a little bit because electric or gas goes up and down. We have paid a, a portion of the, uh, or an equivalent portion of the hotel motel tax as a part of that agreement as well as those other expenses there. So those are ongoing expenses that we had built into the budget. We also built into this year's budget the, um, that we're looking at this evening. We knew if we went down this path, we would likely have some sort of a management fee. So we put in a dollar figure just as a starter. We, I did this way back in October. Um, and then we also put in um, a little extra money because we knew if we made any changes, we would need some extra money to be able to um, change over the business in the first year. So in the budget that you have in front of you, there's $858,000 and some odd um, dollars to that in order to be able to um, use towards uh, the new management contract. So that $858,000 that's available, the approved subsidy um, that was a part of the, the budget that was in the agreement that you saw the other night, is $691,000. I'm round numbering it. Um, and so you might look at that and say, whoo, maybe we can take that money and use it somewhere else. 
I would strongly, strongly, strongly urge you not to do that because this budget, as I explained the other night, is something that they have put together, not being able to see any of the financials because they were private. And so there may be some things that none of us knew that we're gonna find out as we go along in this next year. So that cushion just creates that opportunity to make sure that we're covered, that we don't have to find money in a budget later on. And so um, it works well because seemingly we planned well um, and it works with the new budget or with the new uh, budget that was approved uh, as a part of the agreement. So to have the Grand River Center as one of our uh, amenities within our community, it costs $16.12 uh, as a part of your uh, homeowner property tax. And as a part of this budget, we also um, had that $370,000 that I just talked about. That's an improvement package. Um, not meant to be an ongoing level of funding, but meant to be, we knew we'd have some additional expenses. So that's in those numbers that I just said. And then we have capital improvements that were recommended. Uh, one of them is to replace carpeting in the areas that are listed. And then the other thing that we did is once again, we put a sum of money to be able to be used for capital improvements that might be identified as we make this changeover. So likely new sets of eyes come with other things. They may have some items where it's like, well, if we did this or improved this, that could improve our bottom line performance. And so we have um, requested that money as our two capital projects um, that are recommended this year. And then when it comes to the Grand River Center, our performance measures that we look at, um, one of the things that we've been measuring is, is our own growing sustainable communities conference. And we've always looked at how many attendees and is that growing? And then where do they come from? How many states are coming? Because one of the things that we always try and measure is how many outside visitors do you have coming? If they're coming from other states, that's outside spending. And ours is just one way because uh, other conferences won't necessarily tell us that information. We know this information because it's ours. Now you'll see that there's the gap because um, in 21 and 22 we did not have the Sustainable um, Communities Conference, but um, it's pretty exciting for a comeback to be able in fiscal year 23 to have 380 people that came from 18 different states. And so um, that still shows you that even in that year after missing a couple years, the strong impact that a conference can make within our community in bringing people to our community increasing the spending, but also introducing them to Dubuque and what Dubuque has to offer. Um, and then they also, um, just like with Five Flags Civic Center um, that was mentioned, they go, they eat in restaurants, they're um, you know filling up at the gas station, whatever it so happens to be, and so there is a, a really good economic impact from uh, those conferences and conventions, and that's also why we focused so heavily on that when we went through our um, management agreement. So with that, that's my presentation. All right, well thank you very much. We are in a public hearing to discuss the Grand River Center um, fiscal year 24 budget. Do we have any public comment on this item? Seeing none here, do we have any virtual? No, okay. no input received. All right, back to the table. Ms. Wethel. So um, thank you for pointing out that um, there's a reason that we have a cushion, if you will, and it makes sense to me that we do need that. Um, so just, it looks like it's a little over $167,000. What would happen to that within our budget um, for fiscal year 25? Should that money not be used? What is the process for that? Sure. Um, so each year as we go along, we have the opportunity to request a budget amendment and a carryover. And so if we could now see into, you know, if we're that much down the line, we're going to know a lot more information. So it could be that we request to carry it over, which first has to get through my recommendation to Mike. And if he thinks I'm crazy, he'll say, no, sorry. Um, but overall, if we need it, we would do that. It might be that if I had other areas within all of leisure services that went over for unknown reasons, that it would cover an overage at some point. But it could also be that it just ends up going back into the pool of money that might be needed for other departments that went 
over and needed something to help cushion with it. Or it just goes back into the reserve, I think, right? General fund. General fund. It goes back into the general fund so if it's, not used. It's not restricted should it not be used. Correct. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Mike. Just, just expand on that. Um, usually when we have a uh, money left at the end of the fiscal year, we roll it into the next year's capital improvement program because it's generally just one-time money. Um, in this case, what I'm I fairly certain is going to end up happening is as we have the new managers come into a 20-year-old facility, that money is going to be gone in a heartbeat because the stove is going to be 20 years old and the ventilation system in the kitchen is going to be 20 years old and and you know while we're hoping that everything was well maintained and we believe you know mostly it was I'm betting there's going to be expenses that are just going to be immediate when those new people come in and say hey we can't work with this and you know provide the level of service that you want thank you Mike All right. anyone else in the Grand River Center Okay. Well, in that case, we will move on to the Dubuque Ice Arena, which means that Marie gets a hat trick. <laughs> <laughs> I've been sitting on that one for about five minutes. I, like I thought of it, and I'm like, that's a good one. All right, Marie, good. we're ready for you. Thank you. Maybe you could be a comedian and go to Five Flags, huh? This is, this is as far as my comedic career goes. Thank you very much for the encouragement. All right. Um, so, Marie Ware, Leisure Services Manager, and this is the Dubuque Ice Arena presentation. Once again, all three, all three of these um, uh, budgets with you tonight are all of the managed facilities. So, we lay out kind of the differences and the similarities between them all. So, with the Ice Arena, uh, the city, once again, has that op operations oversight. We also own that building. We do capital improvements to that building, and we do provide operational funding to that building and Schmidt Island Development Corporation, um, along with the DRA in partnership, works with the staffing and the day-to-day -day operations. Marie no longer has to be in a concession stand. <laughs> so, um, when we talk about creating an equitable community of choice, um, once again, um, it's just really, there's these special things that happen within our facilities, and this was another one where um, the Special Olympics competition has been held uh, in the winter at the um, Ice Center for a number of years. And it's always an extremely special event, and it really is one that highlights the individuals. And it's just a joy to watch, and it's a joy to see how special that is in the day of the lives of each of the participants that are there. And I think uh, the picture shows that the mayor was there, and I imagine he can attest to that as well. So having our facilities is really facilities for all, and that's what's so critically, critically, critically important. As a background, just to kind of go back, um, it seems some days like it's a long time ago, but it really was only in June of 21 when we had um, DICE come to us and say, you know, we want to relinquish our rights um, and we're going to basically give this back to you. Um, we went through the process of seeing if, if the other partners wanted to be able to do it. We entered in an, into an interim management agreement and then um, on September 6th, so in very short order, we took over those operations. We operated it from September 6th to December 31st, and then uh, went into an interim staffing agreement with the Dubuque Racing Association, um, and uh, transitioned our employees. So the employees went from working for the nonprofit to working for us, to working for, um, for the ICE Center and the DRA. So, um, in very short order, we did all those things in order to be able to keep everyone skating so that there was not one day that um, that place did not was not open. We had no closed days in all of that transition. Then once we took it over, one of the reasons um, was such a big thing was that we had this settlement problem. And so we closed it down. So they took it over on January 1st, on J um, June 1st. 
Uh, we closed that facility down so that we could do the settlement remediation. And I'm not gonna go into that a lot because I'm sure engineering tonight's gonna go into that a whole lot more. We were closed for the period of time that we said we would be. It was a project that had to be where we had it closed for as short a time frame, and we met our time frames, and so that was a huge success. And then on November 2nd, an open house, kind of new ribbon cutting, and any of you that were there, you saw all the fun and the joy and how much everybody was, and the, the neat thing was to hear the kids so excited to get back. There were these little girls that were just like, I've been waiting to get here so I could skate. I mean, like, they were just visibly excited. That's how important this facility is to those that love skating. Uh, in October, the facility was renamed the Dubuque Ice Arena. On October 20th, we entered into a new agreement with Schmidt Island Management, um, and we, um, we, a management agreement with Schmidt Island Development Corporation, or SID, that's the short, between the SID and the city. Um, within that agreement, we um, agree to pay them $100,000 for a management fee so that they take care of that and, and help us with other things with Schmidt Island. This is so important because we have so many different groups that actually skate there. We have the figure skaters, we have the fighting saints, we have the high school team, we have the youth hockey, we have the fossils, we have the senior saints, and then we also have the colleges that skate there. And so when you look at that, that's a range of peewees to the other end. <laughs> Be careful what I say. Um, and then the other piece of it is, is that it's available for open skate and skate with Santa. And so it is a, a facility that now is be, being able to introduce to a lot of people ice skating. Um, and they have really been working on um, skating rentals, trying to bring school groups there, um, trying to have other youth groups there during the times when it's not being used for all those other groups that were in the previous slide, of really being able to introduce more and more people to um, skating sports. So from a future initiatives perspective, we'll work on completion of the management agreement. We just are, um, we have it mostly done, it's operational, but we have some other uh, details to work through for um, a long-term management agreement. And then also in fiscal year 23, the current fiscal year, we have capital projects, and once again, um, they may be talking about that in engineering in more detail, but we're working on dehumidification systems and, um, and addition of a generator and things. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so uh, the property tax support in order to have the ICE Center open is $5.36. It's a real deal um, for being able to have a place for uh, a wide variety of people to be able to enjoy um, I the ICE. For capital improvements that are budgeted, we have um, the emergency lighting and ventilation. So this is a replacement of four um, energy recovery ventilators that are in mechanical rooms and ventilation in any facility, particularly this one, is really important. Those are at extreme end of life. Uh, a couple are not functional and so they're very much in, in need of having that done. Um, and then also uh, some replacements of some of our emergency lighting, which is you know critical to life and safety issues. Both of, uh, both of these items were identified in an assessment that we had of all the mechanical systems. So one of the projects that we worked on was to have an assessment. We were not only doing the settling, but it identified all those other mechanical systems. So we now have a replacement schedule of things, what's critical, what's coming up, and that so that we can keep track of that. And try. You know, it's always hard to keep ahead of it, but try not to get behind the eight ball. Um, and that's really important. So with that, that's the presentation. All right, well, thank you very much. We are in a public hearing to discuss the Dubuque Ice Arena fiscal year 24 budget. Do we have any public input on this one? Seeing none, do we have any virtual? No. Okay. And no input received. All right, thank you. Back to the table then for any questions or discussion. Um, Mr. Resnick. Mr. Mayor, thank you. So two thirds of what we're paying for this are, is in revenue. Revenue brings in two thirds of what we need for this. And it looks like 667,000. Oh, yeah. 
Um, so in 22, um, there's revenue because that was when we were operating it. So we had money coming in and money going out. Now this is more of we have an agreement with them of how much it would be. And so we'll just have, just like the others, we'll have really the best way to describe it is like a subsidy payment to DRA or Schmidt Island Development, excuse me. Okay, so th does the 373 include the 100,000? Yes, it does. I see. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any others on the ice arena? Go ahead, Ms. Farber. Just a quick question. Does Northern Lights pay a lease to the city, or do they pay a lease to DRA? But to DRA now. It was to us when we were the ones operating it. Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, Marie, thank you very much for all three presentations tonight, but thank you very much for this one especially. And um, with that then, we can move on to our next budget presentation, which is the Transportation Services Department. So we'll, we'll take a minute here and get switched over, and then we'll get started. that one sorry Yeah. Oh, perfect. Yeah. And if you could do it to the same property, that would be great. Okay, so we are on to transportation services. So Ryan, we're ready for you. Good evening, Ryan Nucky, Director of Transportation Services, Honorable Mayor, City Council Members, City Manager Van Milligan, Assistant Manager Corey. Um, I'm here tonight with the honor of presenting the Transportation Services Department uh, budget. And this also includes the Jewel and the Parking Division. So with that, we have a clear mission statement um, to provide transit, park, and services in the city of Dubuque for citizens and visitors, connecting people to employment, services, schools, and recreation. Um, we want to make sure that they're safe, accessible, convenient, consistent, and all done professionally. Tonight during my presentation, you're going to hear me hit two pretty large goals that we're looking at right now. One's in the Jewel. Uh, we're definitely looking at electrifying the Jewel as in getting an electric bus in there, building the infrastructure for that. And then in the parking world, we've, we've met before a couple times. We're doing the Smart Parking Managed Mobility Plan. Um, that is in an exciting phase right now as we're moving forward looking at different technology. Um, the last thing that you'll hear me say a lot is you're going to hear me say thank you a lot. Uh, when I came here last year, I was pretty new, about five, six months in this year, I'm about a year and a half in and it takes a family to put all this together. So as we go through this, if you hear me say thank you, it's because there's a reason I'm thanking those departments. Um, big reason to start um, with me being the director, I do have some very amazing support staff under me. 
Um, operations Supervisor for Parking, Russ Deckline, and Operations Supervisor for Transit, Jody Johnson. Um, a wealth of knowledge. Uh, if I don't know something, I'll go right to them. If they don't know it, we're figuring it out right away. Um, very fortunate to walk in and have those two um, being able to support me. Um, we were sad to see Jake Ironside move on to the GIS team, um, so our transportation analyst position right now um, is open. Um, but our team's not built on top down. We're really bottom up, I put it that way. Um, People joke with me, I'll take my shoes off when I come in our building sometimes because I don't want to get salt on the floor. Because I'm like, if I get salt on the floor, then, then we got to have Jason clean the floor up. And we, we, we work as a family and we want to make sure we're a very solid team as we go forward. Um, we do have a transit advisory board, um, fantastic board. Uh, we usually meet monthly or bi-monthly. And with that, we're discussing what trends we're hearing in transportation. Um, along with that, what are we hearing within the city and what are things that we can work on? Um, that board is chaired by Robert Dodders. Really important part of the city is we're creating that equitable community of choice. And all departments do this differently. Um, the jewel in the parking world, when we're talking resiliency, sustainability, equity, and compassion, we're looking at different ways that we can affect not only what, what we need internally to make our jobs work well, but what's going to help the city in, in the best manner. On the resiliency side, Again, we're working on electrifying the jewel. This is going to help with greenhouse gases. This is going to help with energy. Um, we, this has been a long process. We've met with a lot of different vendors. We've of, met with a lot of different um, employers that could do the, the infrastructure inside the jewel. Um, we're very excited as we move forward with this. Sustainability, um, smart parking mobility management plan. This is just not focusing on our parking ramp technology. This is also collecting the themes for mobility as we move forward. And those mobility might be biking, walking, boarding, transit, et cetera. Equity, um, the Jewel has implemented, implemented our new commuter route. Um, big thanks to Jody Johnson on that. She's done a fantastic job with it. Um, this started in January 9th of 2023. It's a free route that we're giving to uh, the people of Dubuque. Um, starts very early. I had drivers kind of frown at me. You want me to start at 4.30? Yep, we're starting at 4.30 because we have to have people to work by 6. So it starts very early, free morning rides to work, um, and then we have an afternoon shuttle that will get them home from work. And then on the compassion side, with the closure of Fulton Schools, the Jewel and Dubuque Community School District, we sat down and figured out a plan on how to get those kids to the Prescott School in the morning and the afternoons. Um, our drivers are not babysitters, but we have some pretty compassionate drivers that said, nope, I'll take it, bring them on, here we go. Um, some big highlights from fiscal year 23, um, the honor flight was amazing. Oh my gosh, uh, Russ Deckline did an amazing job getting those buses organized, working with people to make sure that it was clearly communicated what had to happen. Um, Jody Johnson did a good job working with the FTA to make sure that we were able to participate in that. Uh, the other thing we participated in was back to school bash. We set up our little tent. It was about 95 degrees out. Super excited to see Anderson there. Um, and with that, we were able to sign up 50 to 75 students that did not have free bus passes. So we're like, hey, sign up. Here's the form. You sign the form. We'll give you your card, and away you go. Um, fantastic program. We love uh, participating in city life. And then last year, we did build the Flora Pool Shuttle uh, with the closure of Sutton Pool for last year. Um, Another thing that we did that actually started in January was the commuter route that we're running. Um, we're about three months into that. We've, had, we've given over 250 rides with it right now. I'm very excited with how it's running. Um, I'll definitely be giving the GDDC a shout out coming up. Our smart parking mobility um, management plan is in progress. Um, again, we're going to talk that in a little while. One of the big things that we did this year, and I want to thank engineering for this, um, especially Steve Sampson Brown, is our park and ramp condition assessment and maintenance plan is underway. We're not complete with it yet, but it's underway. What this is doing is it's going through our parking ramps and we're building a preventative maintenance plan for those ramps. So we literally went through each ramp, looked at the concrete, looked at the structures, looked at the elevators, and from that we have huge documents showing that in year one you need to fix this, in year two this is, is what you need to focus on. This is greatly going to help us with our budgets as we move forward. And the last major thing that we looked at is we hired an ELD certified CDL trainer. ELD is entry level driver trainer. This is a new CDL requirement that as we move forward, um, you need to have um, certain class time before you're able to get your CDL. This not only benefits the Jewel, but other city departments. We're already working with Public Works on two candidates that they brought in that did not have CDLs that we're able to work with them 
get them trained up on it so they can get the classroom training, and then with that, they're able to go take their CDL. So we're very excited about um, what Will's gonna do for not only the Jewel, but the entire city. Some future initiatives we're looking at, um, bus stops. We're always looking at improving our bus stops and the ADA compliance of them, um, and also ADA improvements. I know last year we talked about um, different ways that people can set rides on for our paratransit service, um, different ways that we can get kiosk systems in. So a big shout out to uh, the IT team. Um, TripSpark is a kiosk that we're looking at purchasing coming up. This is gonna help our, our riders that have are, are hearing impaired or even visually impaired so they can navigate through our system a little bit better. I'm gonna mention again, we're integrated the electric buses into our fleet. Um, this has been a challenge, as in we had to go through the jewel, figure out where the best spots to put these buses are. We figure out that location. We go back to the manufacturers. They say, nope, can't do that, too much distance. So we go back to the, the drawing board. Then we had to look at our transformer. We had a Lion Energy down. Um, so it's been a big process, a uh, very, very good learning process as we move forward. Um, and we, we think we have a pretty good setup as, we, as we're, we're progressing forward. Um, equitable route expansion and services. So this is where I do want to give uh, the Greater Dubuque Development Corporation a big shout out on this. Um, the Jewel built the commuter route, the commuter route's running. The GDDC is helping us get with these businesses and work with their HR teams, work with their management teams on how is this working? What's working well with this? What are you hearing inside your buildings? And, and with that, we're getting pretty good information back on, hey, it's running, but can you alter it for these shift hours? Or it's running, but we think it'd, it'd work better in these, these areas. So we wanna make sure we're sitting down with a, a, a large group of these types of businesses so that when we look at rerouting as we move forward, we're, we're making the best choices possible. And then the last thing, smart parking mobility management plan, we're in phase two. So Walker Consulting is currently building a plan based on the city data and public input. Um, Mr. Resnick, you asked last year about knowledge of parking ramps and technology. Uh, oh my gosh, we've gone from zero to probably about 60 pretty fast. We're not gonna hit 100 yet, but we're getting there. Um, Russ Deckline's going to a, a parking convention next week um, to learn more about this, but we've done a lot of conference calls with certain technology that's out there, and then we bounce ideas back off of Walker, and they've had some very good feedback as we move forward. With that, um, for FY24, the transit um, property tax support, we're looking at $22.13 um, per homeowner. And for FY24 parking tax support, it'd be $0. The parking does not receive general fund property tax, but it does receive greater downtown TIF support. So I do wanna kinda specify um, how transit operations and parking operations work. So the Jewel, Transit Division managed fixed route and paratransit services as well as maintenance and planning for transit vehicles, bus stops, and other capital infrastructure. So our buses run around, around the city and I hope you've seen the big green buses go around. Um, with that, we have our three transfer locations, 15 bus shelters. Um, we're always looking at our, at our over 280 bus stops if they're in the right locations. Um, and we have three, 13 light duty buses, which would be our mini buses, our paratransit buses, and our 17 duty, or heavy duty buses. Um, with that, I, I, do, I do like pictures. Um, you'll notice on here there are green buses and orange buses. The green buses are, are within the FTA lifespan. So the FTA, which is our federal assistance that we receive from the federal government and the state government, that money um, they have guidelines on how old buses can be. And another shout out to Public Works. Their maintenance division is amazing. Um, Tom and his team down there are a huge help to us in, in making sure our buses that are past their useful life are still in service and are very safe for our riders to use. Um, so as we move forward, and we not only partner with city departments, but we also partner with, with different groups and organizations. And with that, we are always asking them for support. Um, do Ride is a huge help to us. They do a lot with um, the senior citizens in Dubuque, Iowa. Um, but the Tri-State Coalition Against Human Trafficking and Slavery, they actually came to our drivers' meetings. They did a big presentation for us. This was eye-opening for some of our drivers. They haven't heard about this in a while. Some of our new drivers didn't understand what human trafficking totally was. Um, with this presentation, 
it, it gave our drivers the tools to be identifying what's going on. They see a lot of people every day. Um, we're talking quite a few people every day. And they can be a first responder if they see something that's going wrong. So we, went, we had um, the Tri-State Coalition <coughs> Against Human Trafficking and Slavery come down. They gave a presentation. Our drivers were open with questions. And we got, we got a lot of good answers um, to what we should be looking for as we move forward. Our transit revenue sources. Um, this year, we're looking at a budget of $4,714,295. Um, as I noted before, we do receive federal assistance and state assistance, assistance and you'll see, notice that that's about 50% of our budget for revenue. On the expenditure, expenditure side, <coughs> expenses of $4,363,000. Um, you'll notice two-thirds of that is our employee-related expenses. Um, for the different shifts and hours that our buses are running. Transit historical data, this is a really exciting slide as we move forward. Last year when I stood in front of you guys, we were on a downhill slide. Um, COVID was still really prevalent. FTA still had mass rules going on with, with a mandatory face mask for our buses. Um, we've, we're hoping we hit that bottom. Um, so last year, I presented about 319,000. This year, we're going to do about 300, or in FY22, we did 333,000. Um, this year, we're hopefully projecting about 345,000. So we're hoping to see that projection go up. And the biggest increases that I want to look at are the minibus and our do ride partner. Our minibus took an, about an 8,000 um, ridership jump, which, with looking at those numbers, that's a very large percentage to move up. So we're very excited to see that people are getting more comfortable to go out and use our services to use the great services of Dubuque. Our parking operations. Um, our parking operations is getting a full look over from Walker and RDG as we move forward in Bolton and Meek. Um, but the parking team, it provides and maintains ramps, service lots, and metered parking to support and encourage economic growth, address businesses, and residential parking needs in the downtown area. Walker Consulting has been asking us questions daily on how does this work, where does this go, what are the funds at. I want to thank Jenny Larson's team, especially Russ Deckline um, in my division, for bringing the answers, getting them the, the information that they need that they can keep progressing forward. Um, so as Walker's been going forward, they've been looking at our seven parking ramps. They've been doing, we've been doing study counts, you know, occupancy levels as we go forward. They've been going through the 19 surface lots. Um, we've been looking at our meter districts. We've been looking at the residential parking permit districts and what we need to do future state. Because this program is not for now, it's for the next 10 to 15 to 20 years as we move forward um, with the parking system. This map just shows where our downtown meter districts are. You'll notice that we're quite widespread throughout the downtown city. So Walker has been looking at this, trying to figure out what's the best resource and how do we move forward the best with the city of Dubuque. Our parking revenue source, like I mentioned before, um, we do get TIF money, that's about 48, 49%. Um, total revenue we're looking at is 5136000 And then as far as total expense, 5117000 You notice a lot of these expenses are on supplies and services to keep our, our systems up and running. Parking stats, um, I do like to show this slide, but I do want to make the caveat that we have parking enforcement officers. They're not out there to write tickets. We don't, we don't like to write tickets. That's more processes on our side. We're out there to keep people honest when they're using our parking facilities and structures. So last year's tickets issued was 20,163 tickets. Dubuque does do a courtesy ticket. And I have received multiple emails of people saying, thank you for this. You know, this is my get out of jail free card. I'm like, well, yeah, this is your courtesy ticket, we call it. So we wrote 5,452 of those last year. If people do feel that they were receiving a ticket in the wrong manner or form, um, we do have an appeals process. Um, we had 489 appealed. We approved 300 of them. Um, so people do have, if they would like to question it, they can definitely call down. One of our recommended improvement requests is with the infrastructure plan that came out last year, um, there is a lot of federal money moving forward, especially in the Jewel Transit side. Um, we're looking for a grant writing service, so we're looking for a recurring cost of about $35,000. For capital improvements on, on the transit side, 
As I showed you earlier, about half of our buses are within lifespan and half are without. Um, so next year we're looking for some replacement buses. And then also, like I said, we're always looking at improving our bus stops. So we do have funds in there for in, in improving our bus stops. As we move into the parking world, our parking, as I mentioned in the beginning, we have done a ramp assessment of most of our ramps. We still have two to go, so we have funds in there for that. We did have um, funds previously for a new downtown parking ramp. Now with that on hold, we do have a small amount just to manage the property. Our smart parking system, we have this built over a two-year plan, so it would be in increments as we put this and build this into our system. Municipal parking lot maintenance, this is for the 19 parking lots that we have downtown. This would be for striping and landscaping as we move forward. Port of Dubuque ramp, our major maintenance down there, this is to just maintain that lot, or that ramp as we move forward. Port of Dubuque lot resurfacing, this is a two year program where we would do one section of that parking lot and then move to the section the following year. And then as far as our parking ramp major maintenance, this would be all the ramps put together. With the preventative maintenance program, we're able to identify what are the critical things we need to focus on first. We do have performance measures. Um, I want to give Trevor and the PIO office a big shout out with that. Randy Gale has a fantastic team. Um, we use them all the time for updates. So if the Jewel has an update, we make sure that they know about it. They can get it on our website so people can see that. Um, as I do City Life events, I hear that Facebook is a thing of my generation and not the new generation. So we're going to look at some different ways as we move forward. I hear Instagram's a big thing and Twitter, so we're going to take a look at that. Um, but a lot of our riders are still using Facebook to follow us as we have you know, like snow every Thursday for the last month. We've had snow and ice. So we do update it that way, but um, Randy Gale seems done a great job at helping us with that. Um, as far as performance for our bus stops and within our schools, we want to make sure we get as close as possible to them. Um, we're always looking at different ways to get closer to the schools so that the school children don't have to walk as far. Um, one key thing we always have to look at there is safety because at 10 o'clock in the morning, yeah, you can fit a bus in a lot of these streets, but at 7.30 to 8.30 in the morning, there's a lot of cars dropping off kids, picking up kids, so we want to make sure that we're very safe as we're going through there. Um, and then the last big bullet here is I, we're really pushing to get about 345,000 people um, on honor buses this year, the target goal would be about 350,000. In the parking world, um, again, we don't have parking enforcement officers to write tickets. They are there to keep the system honorable and being used correctly. One ticket that um, we we take a lot of pride and it's very hard to overturn this is our disabled parking spaces citations. Um, if you're parking in there and you don't have signage or proper signage in your vehicle. It's, it's very hard for us to overturn that for you. We want to make sure that they're get, getting used for the correct people. Um, there's a reason that they're there and we want to make sure that they're using properly. Big things that we always look at to measure our service is frequency. We want to make sure that we're getting our buses turning. We're making sure that we're in the right spots at the right times. Reliability, again, I think a lot of departments on helping us out to make sure that um, we're up and running daily. And efficiency, making sure that we have the proper tools to get the job done on a daily basis. I promise I won't say thank you too many more times, but I do want to put a slide in here. Um, we've had the police department, they did de-escalation training with us. They physically sent an officer down. Um, our drivers were able to ask the officer questions on how to handle certain circumstances and what to do. Um, public works, keeping the roads going. Um, we've had a lot of snow in the last month and ice, and they were able to keep a lot of the streets clean so we could function and get people to need it where they needed to go. Um, a big shout out to Chris Coleman's uh, department it's amazing what they can do. We have a lot of old parking technology and it's a daily conversation sometimes. Hey, this ramp's not working, what's going on? And we're looking at the systems. And so a big shout out to the IS team. And then Jenny Larson's team, big shout out to her. Um, Joe and Robin have been fantastic and very helpful with the transition into Tyler and putting the budget system together. And with that, I'm here to field any questions. All right. Well, thank you very much, Ryan. Well, we are in a public hearing to discuss the Transportation Services Department budget for fiscal year 24. Do we have any public input on this item? Seeing no one, do we have any virtual? No. Thank you. No input received. All right.
Yeah, Mr. Sprank. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Ryan, thank you for, for all that you guys are doing, uh, getting everybody around town, of course. Uh, I had a lovely in email this morning from a gal who lives not too far from the 24th Street bus stop, and she was confused as to why all these children were getting on the bus, and I explained it to her as to why they're probably all going to Sutton, or Sutton, not Sutton, they're all going to uh, Prescott School. Mm -hmm. So, um, But I do have a question. We Last summer with Flora, and I think, I don't think, did you ever get those numbers as to how many people actually use that service, the Flora pools? So we had about 420 rides given for that. Okay. Okay. And I know that our leisure services and Marie ducked out already and I don't blame her. Uh, it, if we don't have that, if we don't have possibly Sutton, we might have to talk about doing Flora. Uh, can you tell us what those numbers were? Like actually like the cost of having to do that? Estimated cost look into to do that it. was rate. Oh, um, estimated cost to run that was rate at $40,000. Okay. Because that was a seven day a week operation. Okay. okay. All right. That was my questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Barber. Hi. You talked about expanding potentially some bus stops mm -hmm. and I have been in contact with some residents on Walnut Street who are, I think, um, elderly and find it very difficult to walk down the street and then to have to walk up university to the bus stop, I think that's most close, which would be on the other side of Alta Vista, perhaps. Not quite sure where that stop might be, um, but I pass this on to staff and hopefully we can uh, get back to this gentleman, but it's not only just this person, it's his neighbors as well, uh, who, who are challenged, if you will, to get bus rides. So that means Jody will go for a ride coming up. Um, when we get these requests, Jody and I will physically go look at it, and then what we'll do is we'll actually take the bus through there at the high traffic at times. And if it's a safe area that we can adjust the bus stop, we have no problem doing that. That, right. is, that is not a problem at all. We've had some requests over the year, year where there were requests to move them closer to certain areas, but when we did a trial, it is an unsafe area, and we just can't put our riders in that area or, or the bus to be No, dangerous. I understand that. And, and his comment was, it was at the Walnut Tap or whatever that's called, right there in the corner is where I, he, I, he was looking. I believe I know exactly where you're at. I'll take a note of that and okay, we'll take thank a look you. at that. And then I do have another question about the, um, the phase in on the electric vehicle charging stations, which I think is a great program for us to be moving forward with for sustainability. Do you know, are we going to have charging stations at the bus stops themselves so they can do a fast charge during the, the course time, of the day? At the current time, this is where a lot of research has come into. Um, at the current time, with the technology upgrades that we're seeing in the bus world, um, when we started researching the buses, they were about 440 kilowatts, which sounds like a lot, but and when we did the math on it, in Dubuque living on a hill and having hot summers, cold winters, that would not have sustained us for a whole day. In the year that we've been looking at it, the buses have progressed and we're looking at 560 and 580 kilowatt buses now. Mm -hmm. And with that, that would do about 220 miles on a normal day, which that would encompass a lot of our routes. And with that, with that extra kilowatt power, we'd be able to do a full day. And then when we brought them back to the, um, the JOTC to ch plug them in at night, um, we can set those charging setups to charge between off-peak hours, so we'd be plugging in them out. We could plug them in during the day, but the programs would allow us to turn the chargers on about 11 o'clock and charge them until about 4 in the morning. And with that much charge time, it would give them a full battery that they should be able to make the day. Okay, so eight hours takes care of it then, more or less. It, it, the amount of charge Six. time we would have would give us enough kilowatts to run right. during so the day. Right, so then you don't need a concurrent station right there at those bus stops. Not it at would the current be time. An interesting challenge, I would think, as well. So, so that was talked about when, when the buses were only about 440 kilowatts. That was a discussion. And hey, when the buses get back here, do we just need to plug them in for 10 minutes or five minutes and let them get those short charges? Right. Um, but with the buses progressing, it, it's allowing us to, instead of charging them out on the streets, we can get bigger, faster chargers inside the JOTC to make sure that they make a full day. Well, it's great that we have this phased in over time so we can take advantage of the um, advanced technology that accompanies uh, I, the charging I get, stations. So. I get a lot of questions on, when are you buying that bus? And I'm like, we're still researching it. I mean, um, again, Public Works has done a great job working with us and their maintenance. Um, Tom and I have taken drives to see buses. We've been on phone calls to discuss buses. 
Um, we, we talked to Duluth, Minnesota. I talked to them for about three and a half hours one day, and um, they get cold weather up there, so how does it work? And it was very interesting to hear the math on the kilowatts and how they ran. Well, thank you. It sounds like a fun project. I look forward to seeing the results. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pause our discussion for a second. I think I did miss somebody for public input. Is, am I right there? If you'd like to come up now, go ahead. Now's a good moment. My apologies for moving a little too quickly through that. That's all right. Yeah. Uh, Greg Orwell, I'm the executive director of Do Ride, and I apologize for missing my cue. So we're, we're even. Okay. But just a, a quick summary on where we are with Do Ride. We are uh, about 80% back to pre-COVID levels now, in terms of uh, number of members, number of volunteers, and the number of rides we're providing. Uh, we started in 2008. And it was just really a, a whimsical idea to begin this in the first place. And city council at the time got behind it 100%. And we continue to uh, receive some operating support from, from city council every year, running about 15% or so of what it costs to operate, which is a huge help. Last year, and again going into, into next year, uh, uh, Mr. Van Milligan and, and council through the budget processes has offered an additional $5,000 to help us recover from uh, fairly significant losses we took financially you know, during COVID like so many people did and so many organizations did. But a quick summary, we're at uh, 244 members now. Uh, the high was 257 uh, prior to COVID and we dropped all the way down to about 135. Uh, during COVID, where we basically s ceased all operations except for urgent medical rides. Um, and our volunteers were back up to about 138 active members, our uh, volunteers. I should know too, of those 138, 37 of those folks have been with us since we started in 2008. And that, that's just phenomenal. Uh, the typical volunteer does about seven rides a month. Uh, some do fewer. Uh, we've got one person that did 240 rides by herself last year. So the whole range, as you could imagine, uh, depending on what kind of time people have. Um, February 2000, right, that was the last full month before COVID, as you know, we provided 1,087 rides. And about 55% of our rides continue to be medical of some sort. The other 45% are anything you can imagine, church, uh, you know, shopping, you name it. Uh, wherever they want to go, Dubuque, East Dubuque, and Asbury, we're happy to take them. March 2020, the first full month of COVID, uh, from 1,087 rides to 53. This month, we're projecting we're going to do 899 rides. So that's how much it's come back. Uh, the last, uh, I guess, thought I'll leave with you, since we started through the end of February, we provided 129,245 rides for people 65 and older who need access to transportation. And it's one-on-one -on -one transportation, door to door. They sit in the front seat, which is really a big thing. That's, what you, that's where you put your friend. Uh, you sit in the back seat if you're paying for the taxi. Uh, and the relationships that develop are phenomenal too. For a lot of our members, we are the only social contact they have in a lot of cases as well. So even sending out birthday cards, when somebody gets 35 birthday cards for the 90th birthday, that's a big deal to people that don't have a lot of contact. Uh, but in that uh, 129,000 rides, that's been approximately 1.1 million miles that have been driven all by volunteers. And volunteers have provided uh, in excess of 40,000 hours of volunteer uh, time. We offer a mileage reimbursement and nobody's asked for a nickel since 2012. So they also donate their gas. Uh, so thank you. Uh, it's great working with Ryan. We're trying to coordinate as much as we can with everybody that provides transportation. Ultimately, everybody's goal is when somebody calls one of the transportation providers, no matter what the situation, that's the only call they have to make. If we can't do it, we try to get connected with where they have to go, trying to make that as seamless as possible for folks. Rarely do people plan for the day they can't drive their car anymore. So a lot of times it's an urgency and we're there to help as best we can. So thank you for all of that, for all your support. Thank you very much, Greg. Thanks and we're for being always here. looking for volunteers, because I know you have plenty of time. <laughs> thank thank you. you for that offer. Thanks, Ryan. All right. I didn't miss anybody else, I hope. OK. All right, wonderful. I'll bring it back to the table then for more discussion. Mr. Resnick. Uh, yes, first of all, before my question, I do want to say I really uh, do right is really important, and they they're always willing to partner with people. That's what I like. 
whether it's uh, the, the health people or uh, other uh, nonprofits, they're open to uh, making connections. They want the people that they're giving rides to to have connections with other parts of the uh, community. And I appreciate, I've, I've worked with Mr. Orwell and the group, and uh, it's it was really good. And my question, which is a segue to my question, it says on uh, in the budget here, line 64130, uh, in transit that you have, have payments of $65,000 to other agencies. Is Do-Ride one of those, or what are some of the agencies that you work with? Do-Ride is another agency that we do payments to also. Is that the only, is that the 65,000? No, no, at the current time, Do-Ride, you rate it. We, we support Do-Ride with $30,000. Okay, and, and then there's others. Correct. In there, and it's a, a regularly scheduled thing. And then the, I'm just questioning, uh, about the technology services, about ninety thousand um, dollars. What what is that? What technology services do you use? So, as far as technology services, this would be our eco lane setup. This would be our trip spark. Our, our these would be our routing technology that we use for our our jewel services. Are, are they prescription? I mean, yes, you... it's a software license that we we run through yearly. Okay. We so... we have many different softwares that we have to run. We have Genfair that we work through which that's our, our payment structure. We have Ecolane that does a lot of our routing, um, and that, that's all software subscriptions. Uh, I meant to say subscription, so I think I misspoke. But anyway, it is a subscription that you have to pay a bit every year for, like some of these services. Correct. Which is, okay, great. And and I noticed that you advertise. Um, you know you do social media, but you have your advertising budget is like $3,000. And so, I mean, what, what do you do for advertising? So as far as advertisement, we look at it as we have big green buses driving around the city daily that see a lot of people every day. Um, we have not done a lot with billboards yet. We have not done a lot on social media yet. Um, that is something that we're going to start looking at as we go forward. Um, as we've been working with the GDDC, they've been getting us in a lot of the businesses right now. Um, we've been working with the school systems just on implementing that way, but we have not focused a lot on advertising and spending our funds that way. Yeah, I don't know if that would help or not. I, every time I hear the staple singers sing, I'll take you there, I think of the buses here in, in Dubuque. Uh, and so I, I didn't know if you reached out uh, in different ways to get to let people know about we, we can take you there, you know, that, and you're working on it all the time. I appreciate that to the work you're doing with GDDC and other community, communities within our community. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's a night of sticky songs, by the way, so you're welcome, everyone. All these songs will be in your head all night long. It's still going. Yeah, it's still it's going. Still, yeah, exactly. Everybody, like, everybody in the room, we could just sing it together right now if we felt like it. We won't, but we could. It's like it's a small world. It just keeps on. <laughs> Any others for Ryan while we got him here? Well, I have a couple for you, Ryan. Um, first of all, um, parking. R remind me again, and I apologize if I missed this in your presentation, but um, I know you're coming back to us with some more updates on the parking study. Mm -hmm. um, what's the next time you, you plan to come and speak with us, or what's the general timeline there you're thinking about? We're hoping to come sit down again in, in mid-May. Okay. Would be our goal. All right, so pretty soon, actually, this year to be able to talk about it a little bit more. And, and you said, I think, last time you were here, you're going to kind of give us regular updates on this so the community is aware of where Correct. things are. That's great. That's fantastic. Um, the only other thing I have is a comment, and, and, and that's kind of going off of some things Ms. Farber mentioned. I, I really sincerely appreciate your work and your research on the EV transition uh, for the buses, for electric vehicles. You know, I think, um, I think for, in a lot of people's minds, this is still something that is, is so new and so futuristic that maybe it's not something we should be thinking about all that much. Um, what, what I've seen in, from other cities and in working with people across the country and being able to see what they're doing, um, this is, we gotta get on this bus. You know, we really do have to, we, we really do need to make sure that we are planning for this and looking ahead because there are other cities across the country that are way ahead on this. They give us great examples to work with, but the most important thing is that the money is coming now to be able to help us make this transition from our federal government. So I think we really need to make sure that we're pushing hard. And I, I really appreciate the fact that you're doing that and you're looking at it so closely. The questions that we're asked tonight, you had immediate answers for, and I think that was, it's, it shows that you're really paying close attention to this uh, because it is a challenge. And it's, it's kind of ironic, too, that, you know, in taking a year to try to figure those challenges out, the technology caught up a little bit. Oh, definitely. And, and I think if, you know, not, not that we want to just wait, but the technology is really going to catch up fast here in the next few years. And it's really important for us to take a look at it. 
So I want to do say this. It's, it's a learning curve we're working our way into. Um, I've been talking to Iowa City, um, Duluth, Minnesota, uh, DART, they, they were a big one. I traveled to Omaha for the parking world, but while I was there, I sat down with their transit system, and they were taking almost the same approach we did. They were waiting for people to get in the game, figure out what was working well, what wasn't working well, and then they slowly were taking their steps. And there's about, I believe, a million people around where they, they served. Um, that's what we're trying to do here. We're going to bring on the one bus. We're going to try again for the Lono low this year. But inside that spending, when we do have that money come in, we have to make sure we have enough money set aside for training. Because A, we have to train the drivers to drive it. But now you have a big electric bus that our public works department said, well, who's training us? So we need to make sure we have enough money set aside to, to train that team because this is a whole different realm. It's not an oil change anymore. This is, there's, there's very few brake jobs you do in this. It's all electricity and how it's run. Along with that, not that I want to say it again, but the fire department said they're just going to push it in the river because they don't know how to put it out yet. So we need to train them on how, how to handle it if there's a big issue because, again, if we do get involved in an accident, and let's hope we don't, you know, that's a lot of power sitting there. How do they safely cut the power to it so that they can safely get on the bus to get people off if needed? So we've definitely been looking at the, at the training side of it. And both the manufacturer that we've started working with on this, um, they have fantastic startup programs for us um, to bring people on site to work with us and to train with us. And as I've reached out to other sites, they've said, well, just send your mechanics here. We can, help. We can show them what to do. We can kind of give them a, a electric bus 101 training. That's a great add-on. That's really helpful information, so thank you. Mr. Mayor? Yeah, Ms. Just Harvey. an add-on to that. Um, I can compare this to um, when the technology for software and computers was evolving um, into the internet age and beyond. They, um, the industry got together and determined, uh, with a little help from the government, that there would be what they call open architecture, so that there is no proprietary um, software that doesn't work potentially with other people's software so that you can't point fingers as to uh, what may happen when you plug your telephone in and all of a sudden it's somebody else's problem kind of thing. And so I think with the EV um, architecture that's going on now, it is becoming more open and there are industry standards, I think, that are in place right now as well. So you're really at the point, we are really fortunate that all of this is occurring now, so that in a year to two years, it's going to be totally flexible. And whether you're buying a truck um, or a bus uh, in the United States or elsewhere, it'll all be common, and the charging stations will accommodate it all. So thought I'd share that with you. Thank you. You bet. All right. Well, good discussion. Thank you very much for the presentation, Ryan, and, and everyone in Transportation Services for all the work that you're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, then we will move on to our final budget presentation of the evening and the season with engineering. So let's take two or three minutes. We'll take a break, stand up a little bit, and then we'll get started. Yeah, almost there with industry standards. There's industry standards, then there's Tesla. Oh, hi. Yeah, that's that's right. exactly.
Right. It's been very impressive to see how competitive it still is. Well, you're home. This is going to lose much. We yeah. can start to gather and back up here. Still, it works. Gus, when do I start the timer? I've got people timing. <laughs> Let him rip. Well, we need people we can trust. <laughs> 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 if you want to, keep track. All right, everybody. Well, we have made it. We have made it to this moment to our mighty closer, there we the go. The engineering closer department, like the, which yeah. is always such a fascinating presentation every year. So without further ado, Gus, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Good evening, Mayor and members of the City Council. I'm Gus Sohoyas, City Engineer, and I present to you the engineering department's budget. The engineering department mission statement, the engineering department promotes the health safety, welfare of all through sound engineering principles, practices, and partnerships applied to planning, design, maintenance, and the preservation of the city's infrastructure and property. We welcome this year uh, engineering technician Luke Rupp and engineering uh, technician Jeff Brandt to our team. Uh, both of them came with about 20 years of experience, so they hit the ground running and their work is fantastic, so we got lucky there. And we also got lucky when we uh, welcomed civil engineer um, Max O'Brien to the engineering department. He primarily works with the sanitary sewer collection system. Uh, one of his duties this year, with many of them, is uh, working on the sanitary sewer master plan, which he updated you a few weeks ago. Welcome, Max. Um, we have a vacant camera technician position that we've advertised to open until filled. So this has been a hard position for us to fill. It was approved a couple years ago, and we had somebody in the position for about uh, three months and left for a substantially higher um, salary. So um, it's a critical position uh, so we can effectively manage and maintain the many cameras we have throughout the uh, community. And uh, without this, our traffic uh, engineering staff is being spread fairly thin. Here's a quick snapshot of our organization chart for our department. It includes 40.92 full-time equivalents. This includes our facility maintenance staff, engineering staff, and seasonal interns. <clears throat> we run the department like a full-service engineering firm would. We provide assistance to other departments, and we can design projects from conceptual state to final completion. The engineering department continually incorporates, incorporates equity in our work through an equitable community of choice through planning, partnerships, and people. As part of the engineering department equity plan, we are focused on youth mentoring activities and exposure to potential careers in the engineering and construction industries. Uh, we hosted the Pollinary Week at the B Branch, and we got kids involved from all parts of the community. Uh, we are participating in the MFC uh, Career Fair, and our team is coordinating with the Dubuque Community School District and partnering in career days with the senior and Hempstead High Schools. We also provide job shadowing, opportunities for students interested in civil engineering and construction careers. We continue to work for other, look for other ways to get students involved in diverse with diverse backgrounds, interest in engineering, public works, and potentially working for the city of Dubuque in the future someday. Here are some photos of activities we have done with the students. Uh, Steve mentioned that I'm supposed to bring up the slide because I think this was his idea, so he's really proud of that slide. So here you go, Steve. Uh, here's some more pictures that we have. And uh, here's a list of some of the major items that we have on our to-do list. Uh, I wasn't going to mention them, but I'll just brief, briefly go through them. Uh, we're working on the east-west uh, corridor design, the complete streets. Dave Ness and his team is working on that. The old mill lift station, force main project. Uh, Todd Irwin, an uh, engineering tech, leading that effort. That's over a $25 million uh, construction project. And like I said, um, and you heard a few weeks ago, um, we're working on the sewer as asset mas master plan. 
Uh, some other projects that engineering is working on, some of the major projects for this coming year is the, the Industrial Center Crossroads project, the Kerper and Kerper uh, Roundabout project. We're working on that uh, continuously. Uh, sanitary and sewer improvements in the catfish area. The 42-inch uh, force main stabilization project is a big job. And I wanted to mention the JFK sidewalk project after many, many years. We're starting that next week, so that'll be a nice project to get uh, crossed off the list. Um, we're also working um, on the lead water surface potential project, uh, looking at the coordination efforts there and how our, our staff will be involved with other staff. And here's some of the subdivision projects that uh, we're involved with in the review. We also have many site plans that we review with multiple staff, including platting, stormwater work, uh, detention requirements, utility connections, traffic control, uh, all those different things we look at every site. Uh, staff uh, will be working with other departments in discussion with the Central Avenue Corridor Project, including items related to um, traffic. Uh, we'll also uh, be coordinating the RAISE grant, planning grant, and the East-West Corridor study that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, these are some of the recommended improvement levels in the engineering department. These improvements uh, are related to education and equipment, equipment needs for our department. You can see many of them are under $3,000, one to $3,000. I won't read through all these. Um, these improvements include weather gear for our field staff, OSHA training, and some non-reoccurring intern positions. Uh, these recommended improvements include a non-reoccurring uh, records intern and additional equipment for staff. Uh, the property support for the engineering department for average homeowner is $11.64. So next, Max O'Brien will present the sanitary sewer budget. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Max O'Brien, a uh, civil engineer with a focus on sanitary sewer collection systems. Um, just wanted to take some time and go over some of our FY24 initiatives. Um, so first off, our consent decree compliance program took effect with the APA in 2011 with the goal to eliminate sanitary sewer overflows or SSOs within our system. Um, there's several things that can contribute to SSOs, but one of the primary concerns that was identified for our system was excessive I and I, or excuse me, inflow and infiltration. Um, so in terms of sanitary sewer, I and I is generally just the introduction of non-sewage flows into the sewer system. Um, this is a concern as the additional flows uh, could create backups and eventually SSOs. It can and also incur extra costs at the treatment plant to treat the additional volume that's received. So we've identified five sewer sheds within our system that have identified excessive I and I. Um, the corrective action plan was developed to systematically address these issues within these sewer sheds. We've made a lot of good progress, but we're not quite done just yet. So the two projects shown here are currently under design and we have anticipated construction completion sometime in fiscal year 24. And the four projects listed here are planned to begin design in fiscal year 24 with the anticipated construction completion in fiscal year 25. Um, so aside from these projects and the corrective action plan, we have several other current initiatives that will continue to work towards our goal of bringing the sewer up to accommodating the city's needs, uh, current needs and our future growth, or satisfying future growth requirements. So first off, we have the Terminal Street Lift Station project, uh, which is uh, occurring to address some structural and maintenance related items that were identified during uh, uh, inspection activities. Next, we have the 42 inch sanitary force main stabilization project with the design efforts being led by the uh, US Army Corps. This project is going to restabilize the slope uh, along the Mississippi River and armor the force main, which will protect the pipe and help reduce the chance for damage from debris or barge strike during high river levels. Um, the estimated total for this project is approximately 5.3 million, um, funded through the various sources shown here. So another one of our current initiatives uh, is the Old Mill Lift Station project with a estimated total of approximately $22 million over the next few years. Uh, this project will include the design construction of a new sewer lift station 
uh, and a dual force main system within the Catfish Creek sewer shed. So the existing Catfish Creek lift station serves an area of approximately 16.5 square miles, which covers roughly half the city's footprint. Um, with the level of adult developments that the city's experienced over the last 25 years, the, that station is nearing its original design capacity. So the new Old Mill lift station is going to take most of the demand off of that and convey flows directly to the treatment plant just to alleviate those uh, potential SSOs. We are also working on improvements to the Granger Creek lift station, which was originally installed to serve the Dubuque Technological <coughs> Park. Uh, this improvement project is being designed also to accommodate additional uh, developments within the sewer shed. Uh, the Twin Ridge Lagoon Abandonment Project is one of those projects that's being developed within the Granger Creek uh, sewer shed. This project will involve the extension of sanitary sewer to the Twin Ridge subdivision, which allows the abandonment of the existing lagoon system, whose uh, DNR permits will expire this coming 2024. Another Granger Creek uh, sewer shed project is the extension to uh, sewer extension to serve the Tamarack Business Park, which is shown in blue. Um, the, this uh, sewer extension is required uh, to meet some. Uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. This extension is required to comply with the uh, current uh, development agreement. Um, from there, the current budget also includes funding to install a sewer system that serves the Dubuque Industrial Center Crossroads, which is the the phase shown in red. So starting in fiscal year 22, um, the city has budgeted funds to systematically inspect the sanitary sewer system over a 10-year period, of which we currently have approximately $377,000 available. Uh, this program follows NASCO standards and, system and will systematically collect data on the previously uninspected uh, sewer within our system, which as of at the, the end of uh, 2022, uh, that was approximately 50 to 60%. So this program will include inspections of both pipeline and manholes uh, since, I'm sorry, this program includes both pipelines and manholes. Um, most of our available manhole inspection data is limited to our trunk sewers where we collect the data for previous studies such as the Catfish Creek study. Uh, but we're getting a little bit, we're getting more aggressive with these uh, inspections on the manholes with new technologies like what you're seeing there. Of the system that we've inspected uh, through 2022, we've I compiled a list of major defects that we've identified within the systems. Uh, defects that would include holes, deformities, collapses, excessive I&I, and, &I, and so on, and develop some preliminary recommendations and costs to repair, replace, or rehabilitate each of those defects. Ultimately, this program is gonna help us get ahead of instances like what's shown on the screen on 17th Street where there was a manhole failure um, we want to get ahead of it where we're not solely re or primarily reacting to failures once they reach the surface. We want to identify it and address it before this occurs um, and promote proactive improvements instead of reactive maintenance. Um, so each year, we, our, our budget includes funds for gener general sanitary sewer pipeline and manhole replacements. Uh, the fiscal year 24 budget includes a combined $252,000 for, the, for those activities. So working in tandem with the CCTV inspection program, we're developing our sanitary sewer asset management program, um, which is going to take a risk-based approach to evaluating and prioritizing each of the three components of our sewer system, which would include the gravity collections, the pressurized conveyance, and the uh, wa wastewater treatment facility. Oops, sorry. Lost my notes. <laughs> so factors to the prioritization will include, but not be limited to, sanitary sewer capacity, condition, and maintenance in accordance with the EPA's best practices guide or best practices guidance doc documents. Um, so I wanted to show this this quick figure again from from my previous presentation. Um, this is just a figure showing that uh, that expected useful life or design life of our sanitary sewer, our existing sanitary sewer system, based on our available age and material data. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean the sewer is bad, but it helps us inform where we should focus our efforts for inspection based on typical industry trends and observations. So, for this program, our request for qualifications to the consultants is currently out. 
Um, submittals are due in early April, and we hope to have our first task order, or selected a consultant and negotiate our first task order to begin in early June. So using similar risk-based analysis, um, that led us to projects such as this with the uh, Brunsko Road uh, collector sewer reconstruction. Um, this segment of sewer has a high risk associated with it. It's from its age, the recurring costs due to root maintenance, uh, structural defects, and evidence of I and I throughout the throughout this segment of sewer gave it a high likelihood of failure based on its condition and its capacity impacts. While it's being located along a stream bank with several sections exposed um, and being immediately downstream of several uh, recent site plan developments that we've received um, gives us a high consequence of failure based on its social, environmental, and economic impacts, or potential impacts, I apologize. So long story longer, um, here's our complete list of sanitary sewer projects proposed in the fiscal year 24 pro uh, budget with a total of approximately $8.4 million. And I believe Darren's up. Good evening. I'm Civil Engineer Darren Meering, and tonight I'm going to be presenting the Engineering Department Stormwater Management Budget. Like every other property owner in Iowa, the city is responsible for managing stormwater on its property. In the city's case, that includes city facilities, but also street right of way. In addition, the federal Clean Water Act requires the city to take steps to mitigate environmental issues associated with urbanized areas, things such as petroleum or sediment, things that you know, generally occur in an urban setting. Um, those requirements uh, include reviewing stormwater management plans for developments an acre or larger to ensure they don't increase the peak flow of runoff from the site following development. Uh, that includes both large subdivisions uh, all the way down to in individual lots and site plans. Uh, we're also required to inspect all construct active construction sites an acre or larger once every quarter. This past year, we performed 228 inspections at 87 different sites. Uh, we also are required to go back and inspect previously approved sites to ensure that the stormwater management systems were built and are being maintained as designed and approved. In addition to providing for the drainage on city property, we also look into uh, work to address some major flooding issues uh, throughout the city. And the most prominent example is the multi-phase B branch watershed flood mitigation project. Um, since 2001, the city's been systematically working to implement the various watershed improvements in the watershed. Uh, the latest to be completed is the upper B branch creek restoration project, which included the B branch uh, creek railroad culverts project. Um, these improvements were constructed between the lower B branch and the upper B branch through the railroad property, um, railroad yard on Garfield Avenue. Uh, here's a 2013 visual of what the area looked like uh, after completion of the lower B branch on the right, but before construction on the upper B branch. Um, and then compared to the area uh, with the improvements completed in 2022. And to show what, that, what the improvements are to kind of highlight those including the tunneling of the culverts under the railroad tracks and repurposing the existing culverts uh, to, to allow for a hike bike path again under the railroad tracks. The most important benefit though of, of the improvements is flood mitigation, increasing the flood protection from a 75 year to a 500 year flood. Uh, the final uh, railroad culvert project was about 32.3 million, um, again due to state and federal funding assistance the, city was, the city's share of the cost was only about $16.5 million. Uh, all planned construction uh, is also complete on the 22nd Kaufman Avenue storm sewer improvements and the 17th West Locust Street storm sewer improvements. Um, the improvements on 22nd Street are complete from the B branch uh, west uh, to just west of North Main. And future, we have it designed all the way to Kane Street, uh, the blue dash line. Uh, but future phases will depend on uh, additional funding. Um, with each improvement in the watershed, our system becomes incrementally better at mitigating flooding. And, and here's just an example. So this photo shows uh, 22nd Street uh, from Central Avenue, kind of just looking to the west uh, with the water rushing towards you here. And this is just a moderate rain in 2016 before <coughs> completion of the B Branch Creek project, before extending the storm sewer improvements west on Kaufman Avenue. 
And the image on the right here is a rain, a similar rain in July of 2022 with the improvements in place. And while the rains were similar, uh, the, result, the resulting flooding or lack thereof on the right is drastically different. Uh, what we don't see here and what we don't have is camera footage kind of far to the west upstream of here <coughs> to see what's actually happening uh, beyond where the improvements have been constructed. Uh, on 17th Street, we've completed the improvements from Elm Street to just west of Hebe Street. Um, these photos show, uh, again, of that same rain in last July, uh, illustrating the, the, the continued need for drainage improvements up 17th and West Locust Street. So definitely uh, have a need to continue that project. Uh, we've also been making progress on the B Branch uh, maintenance facility site this past year, completing the work associated with the two US EPA cleanup grants. Uh, all told, we received 600,000 to help uh, clean up both the east uh, site, which is in the background there across the railroad tracks, and the west site in the foreground there. And then in the future five-year plan, we have money to start the actual redevelopment of that site into uh, a public, for the maintenance of the B Branch, also for public parking and a public restroom um, for the area. Uh, we had planned to have the B Branch gate and pump replacement project under construction at this point. Um, this project is to replace the existing pump station on Kerper Boulevard. Uh, the pump station functions in conjunction with the flood wall levee system that protects the city from Mississippi flooding. You know, when we're, when the Mississippi's in flood stage, stormwater runoff from the B Branch watershed has to be pumped uh, over the levee or through the levee into the river. And some of the elements of this existing pumping facility are more than 50 years old, even predating the flood wall itself that was finished in the 1970s. Uh, the improvements were to increase the resiliency of the uh, facility by modernizing it, uh, increasing its flood mitigation capacity, like doubling the pumping capacity. Um, the design of the improvements, we completed that late in 2021, and we had adopted a funding plan with the FY23 budget. Um, the plan included the various funding sources identified here. Uh, again, we were able to secure uh, over $12 million in local, state, and federal funding to offset the cost of local citizens. And we initiated bidding for the last spring for the construction contract shown here at $15,790,000. Uh, unfortunately, the low bid was uh, quite a bit higher than that, uh, nine million, almost nine million, nine million more than the estimate. And as a result, we had to reject the bids. So we're currently pursuing two options for moving forward. First, we're seeking additional funding assistance. There are things that we're working on currently on that regard. Uh, second, we're looking into a project that would provide for a smaller pump station, sort of an auxiliary station that would work in conjunction with the existing facility. So provide the benefits that we wanted with the original one, but then it would allow us to uh, decommission that or replace the existing facility maybe 10, 15 years down the road uh, when funding allows but have the uh, flood fighting ability uh, much sooner. Um, here are the uh, B Branch Watershed Flood Mitigation Projects planned for the proposed five-year CIP. So in addition to the pumping station, the maintenance facility, there's also funding for the water treatment plant protection system, our only um, drinking water uh, supply for the city for that plant, and then North End Storm Storm Improvements. Uh, because of our local, state, and federal partnerships, the city has been able to secure uh, over $167.5 million for the B Branch Watershed Flood Mitigation Improvements. And considering that the improvements will prevent uh, upwards of $582 million in damages over the decades to come, it means that the citizens of Dubuque will uh, avoid uh, flood damages of around $7 for every dollar that we're spending. Here's a complete list in FY24 CIP projects totaling about $4.25 million. The monthly stormwater fee for the average homeowner is proposed to increase by a dollar in FY24. This table shows the stormwater rates over the years. Um, back in 2012, uh, when the city first committed itself to addressing the flooding within the B Ranch watershed, Again, the flooding that regularly impacted 1,300 properties. Uh, the stormwater rate was to increase to $9 in FY17. But due to that assistance that I highlighted previously, uh, the assistance from our funding partners, raising the rate was to be delayed until fiscal year 2022. Uh, but then again, due to the economic uncertainty of the uh, COVID pandemic, we delayed that even further. So it didn't reach $9 until actually FY23 last year. 
uh, six years later than initially uh, adopted. Uh, Dubuque continues to have the second highest storm utility rate among Iowa's larger communities. However, that gap has, has been steadily closing over the past few years. Um, just as a, one example, uh, you see Cedar Rapids is the second right behind Dubuque. Um, as most know, Cedar Rapids is working to implement flood mitigation improvements of their own. Uh, according to a recent article in the Cedar Rapids Gazette, the city of Cedar Rapids' budget actually includes a 1.35% property tax increase to help with their, their flood fighting. So that would be on top of their stormwater utility fees. So uh, our project, we are not using any property taxes for our flood mitigation project. Uh, since 2003, when the stormwater utility was established, the city was, has provided subsidies to kind of offset the cost of the fee uh, to certain segments of the population. So this, this is proposed to continue in FY24. Uh, these subsidies are for property tax exempt um, organizations, low to moderate income residents, and, and residential farms. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to John Deans to talk about the street program. Thank you, Darren. Hey, good evening, my name is John Deans. I'm a civil engineer uh, in engineering, and I'll start on the street por uh, streets portion of the presentation, and I'll hand it over to uh, Nate Steffen, who's pinch hitting for Bob. Uh, the engineering department manages the public right away, and here are some stats for the work that we've done this past year. Uh, I wanna point out the significant increase in the right of way permits that we've issued. A lot of these are related to the fiber of the home project that's occurring in Dubuque currently. We have also had our second highest total for Iowa one call tickets. Our department locates all city utilities within 48 hours of a notice of an excavation as required by Iowa law. We are in the second year of our volunteer effort called DBQ Shovel Crew. Um, this effort involved recruiting uh, 26 volunteers, of four of which were staff that assisted with removing snow from public sidewalks at 41 locations. So we've almost doubled the number of addresses that we're serving and the number of volunteers that we have in the program. Uh, residents need to be financially, have to financially qualify for the program and be unable to perform the work themselves. Uh, residents can sign up on the Volunteer DBQ website and on the City of Dubuque website. And I want to thank the volunteers that are they're out there helping. And I will also point out that um, as we work through the program, you start to see neighbors helping neighbors, which is awesome. And that's really what we're really trying to encourage people to do. Here are two uh, completed projects. Uh, just want to some highlights. Uh, talk about the Stoneman Road project was completed last fall. And this project included new pavement, storm sewer, and some sanitary sewer repairs. Uh, the project also uh, looped the water main into Kennedy Mall so that we now have a looped connection which is, provides redundancy but also improves water quality. Um, the project also included new sidewalk connection to Hills and Dales and turn lane improvements on Stoneman Road and on JFK Road in this area uh, were constructed um, related to a, the development nearby, a bank and, uh, and a retail development. In the lower right, you'll see the Chavanel Road project was completed last summer with the completion of the sidewalk on the south side of the street. This makes Chavanel Road from the Northwest Arterial Disciple Road what we would call a complete street since it's providing equal access to people with vehicles, bike, and pedestrian. Um, and also we did ADA improvements uh, near the uh, bus shelter, so we're, we're touching all of those. Uh, this is, the, we've got some projects I want to talk about just mainly in the design side uh, where we worked through which uh, these are all federal aid projects and so significant amount of effort uh, involved with staff in order to be able to bring these to, to uh, bidding. It's literally a one year process. Um, so the JFK sidewalks project was awarded to Midwest Concrete that are going to begin construction next week. The Bee Branch Creek Phase 1 Trail by the Alliance Solar Field was awarded to Chig Fry, and they will begin construction in early May. And we continue to work on the final plans for the Chaplain Schmidt Island Connector Trail project, and that is funded with community project funding, and will be left by the Iowa DOT in July. And we anticipate construction being complete by Veterans Day. So, a year of trails for me. Uh, we are also working on the design of the Kerper Court and Kerper Boulevard roundabout project. This is a, 
project in coordination with the development, uh, where the, the uh, private, uh, um, where the, the um, developer is uh, providing half the funding for this project, and uh, we're looking, and they're looking to develop the adjacent site. Uh, looking through design currently, and uh, hope to uh, look at construction uh, perhaps later this year. I mentioned the Chapman Schmidt Trail earlier. Um, this will connect the Piasta Channel Trail. If you're familiar with that, that, where that location is, and then um, it will connect that and extend it to just beyond the Veterans Memorial Site on the island. You can kind of see the alignment in the map right there. Here again is the Bee Branch Trail Phase One project, and this is one phase of a trail connection that will eventually connect the historic Millwork District to Chapman Schmidt Island and to the Bee Branch Greenway. And we're working on connections really in the key areas as we build up bike facilities in the city, and this is one part of it. As I mentioned earlier, the JFK uh, Sidewalk Project begins next week, and this is a Iowa DOT Transportation Alternative Grant Funds project. Safe routes to school. Um, then it, the safe routes to school funds do help reduce costs to the abutting property owners as well as to the city. Uh, the Heap Street project is a project that we're finali finalizing design. We'll look to bring that to the council here um, very soon. Uh, it's a full reconstruction project that had been <coughs> delayed until now. It's a rather tricky site um, due to rock, a lot of rock in that area and very tight right away. And we're trying to work on a, a, a cul-de-sac to help assist public works but being able to turn around when plowing the street. Um, so we're finishing up design and planning to put this out uh, this spring, construction this summer. Uh, street maintenance uh, has been listed as a city council policy agenda um, a high priority and this is a pavement rehabilitation and preservation capital improvement program. Um, would support that goal. This, this program would provide funding to complete pavement rehabilitation on concrete streets that are in deteriorating condition. Uh, we're planning to address the North Grandview Corridor first. I think there'll be lots of uh, huzzah with from some of the residents up in that area. And then we'll be uh, working to rehabilitate other streets as funds allow. The first section in Grandview will be from Loris Boulevard to Rosedale up near Senior High School. Um, we also are showing in this lower left corner um, the Plaza Drive and Holiday Drive uh, intersection. It's over near Red Robin, if you're familiar with that area. Is. There's very poor subsoils that, that are contributing to pavement degradation, and that uh, intersection is going to require reconstruction um, this summer. So we're looking through, uh, working through phasing and traffic because it's going to be tricky to provide access to all those businesses, but we're working through that. Uh, both the Grandview Avenue pavement work and the Plaza Holiday Drive work are planned for this summer. And then here is a list of our FY24 uh, capital improvement projects for streets and right away. And I'd like to turn things over to Nate Steffen. Thank you, John. Good evening, Mayor and City Council, Civil Engineer, Nate Steffen. Well, I think it's fair to say that anyone who was around Dubuque area last construction season was aware of the major work that was occurring on the Northwest Arterial. We are approximately 50% complete with the project. Uh, work started on the project on Monday for this year. The blue line on the graphic represents the southbound lanes from US 20 to John F. Kennedy that were completed last year, including the reconstruction of the Asbury and Pennsylvania intersections. This past Monday, construction resumed on the Northwest Arterial. The tan line on the graphic represents the northbound lanes that will be reconstructed during the 2023 construction season. The project will be completed by the time school starts in August. This eight and a half million dollar project has been a big effort for the engineering department and I would like to acknowledge the dedication of both Hugh McCarran and Luke Rupp for the many long days, long nights and weekends spent on the project. Thank you guys. Now I will talk about the East-West Corridor initiatives. The US Highway 20 corridor is the primary east-west route in the city of Dubuque 
and future traffic volume projections indicate US Highway 20 alone will not provide sufficient capacity for east-west travel in the city. Capacity along the alternate east-west corridors will need to be improved to provide connectivity between the western growth areas and the downtown urban core. In February of 20, 2012, the City Council formally adopted the east-west corridor connectivity study final report and directed city staff to begin Im implementation plans. <clears throat> now I will talk about the east-west corridor capacity improvement initiatives. In an effort to advance this top council priority, the city has already completed $3.25 million in corridor improvements shown on this slide. In December of 2021, the mayor and city council approved the selection of HDR as the consultant to complete the preliminary engineering design and environmental clearance phase to advance the development of the east-west corridor capacity improvements along University Avenue. The graphic on this slide shows the most recent preliminary design concept for this corridor uh, at Delhi, Loris, Asbury, and Pennsylvania intersections. A year ago, in March of 2022, with the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act funding allocation to the state of Iowa, the Iowa DOT announced the increase in new federal funds will require additional state primary road funds to be used as the state's local match. As a result, this will impact the Iowa DOT's ability to provide swap funds on city to be projects. With the reduced swap fund capacity, the Iowa DOT informed all cities that all programs or projects will transition from swap to federal aid funds starting last month. With the transition in February from swap 100% funds to federal aid, which are 80-20 funds, the city uh, needed to identify and allocate an additional $2 million as the city's 20% local match which is shown in the project funded funding table highlighted in blue. Due to the funding shift uh, to federal aid, this will require the environmental study phase to be elevated to a NEPA level clearance. This slide outlines the phase one and phase two elements for the federal environmental review. Due to the additional level of work to meet the NEPA level regulatory requirements, this will delay the environmental clearance phase by eight to 12 months and will add additional costs to the consultant design services contract. <clears throat> As the city and consultant team progress through the preliminary design and NEPA level clearance process over the next year, there will be two public information meetings uh, held this summer and this fall. The public open house meeting will provide property owners and citizens the opportunity to receive information about the project and allow the public an opportunity to provide input. Once the, the preliminary engineering and NEPA clearance are completed, corridor impacts will be identified and property acquisition could begin. It would take approximately two years to complete. Once property acquisition is complete, complete with within the overlap section, construction to convert the three intersections along University Avenue to roundabouts could begin and would take approximately two to three years to complete. In August of 2022, the city was awarded a raised planning grant to assist with the planning and design of a multimodal transportation corridor project entitled Building Bridges to Employment and Equity. The city has been working closely with the Federal Highway Administration and the Department of Transportation to develop a project funding agreement and secure advance authorization to hire a design consultant. The action steps moving are to execute a funding agreement and begin the federal aid consultant selection process, which will take four to six months to complete. It is the objective of the city to complete the planning and design so that we have a shovel ready project which will be well positioned to uh, compete for future raise implementation grant opportunities. <clears throat> In February, the city, East Central uh, Intergovernmental Association or ECIA and our regional local partners were notified of our uh, awarded Safe Streets for All grant the Safe Streets for All grant will assist with developing a regional roadway network comprehensive safety action plan. 
Iowa State University uh, Institute for Transportation will lead the effort to, to development of a comprehensive safety action plan for the regional roadway network to achieve long-term objective of reducing transportation-related injuries and working towards zero deaths. It is the objective of the city, ECIA, and partners to complete an action plan so that we have identified potential roadway or intersection improvement projects which will be well positioned to compete for this grant uh, uh, for future opportunities. Moving to the Southwest Arterial Corridor, the city and the Iowa Department of Transportation are continuing to develop an implementation of an intelligent transportation system, or ITS, along the Southwest Corridor. The city and IODOT will be installing a fiber optic communications and ITS network consisting of cameras, sensors, dynamic message boards, and other related technology to support transportation and public safety applications. The city is responsible for designing, constructing, operating, and maintaining the fiber optic communications and ITS system, including providing fiber optic cable reserved to be used by the Iowa DOT. <clears throat> the state of Iowa is contributing $1.9 million to the project. From ITS to traffic operations, I will turn it over to Dave Ness. Thanks, Nate. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Dave Ness, a traffic engineer for the City of Dubuque. I am joined by fellow traffic engineers, Dwayne Richter and Justine Hull. Oh boy, I'm reaching that age. <laughs> uh, current breakdown of duties. Uh, this changes from year to year, but this year, more time has been spent on fiber deployments and broadband expansion. I'm sure you've heard about it and seen it. Um, I'm gonna be talking about that quite a bit. Also due to increased development in the area, much more time has been spent on traffic impact studies and site plan reviews. And Justine Hall will detail that later in the presentation. Here are a key few projects that we've completed this year. Uh, Asbury JFK signalization reconstruction and the Grandview Avenue lighting slash camera slash communications project which was a joint build um, with IMON's Fiber to the Home project. And I'd, I'd like to thank the driving public and, and pedestrians for their patience around these projects. They're, they're difficult to build and it's, it's, uh, it takes a lot of patience from the surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, we also continue to work on other private public communications projects, utilizing a dig once policy, which preserves right away and offers significant cost savings. You're gonna see a, a theme to my presentation tonight with that. Some upcoming projects include private-public partnerships opportunities and a number of uh, intersection improvements. Next, I'd like to discuss some of the fiber and communication expansion initiatives. Um, shown here are different, tech, different duct technologies that we utilize um, underground. Um, Every city department and probably every citizen will be positively affected by the installation of a robust high-speed fiber communications system. So I think you've seen this presented multiple times probably. Um, I just contacted IMON and got the latest information. Uh, this is a very large undertaking. They're, um, this is the proposed build for 2023. There's 31 cabinets. If you look at that map, all those little you know, divided areas are an individual cabinet that's gonna go in, and each cabinet feeds four to 500 addresses. Uh, it equates to 12,000 plus addresses that they're gonna be reaching this year. Almost 400,000 feet of aerial fiber and 360,000 feet of underground trenched or bored conduit. So it's, it's gonna be a significant project. Um, and this is assuming all goes right. They wanted me to clarify that, because it <laughs> doesn't, doesn't always. Um, but that's their goal. Uh, it's gonna require significant engineering time from us. And um, it's, it's kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity for partnering and mutual needs. 
The process of building a network involves gathering all of the needs. Um, our city Dubuque broadband group um, met with all the different city departments and compiled a list of needs, of communication needs that they were gonna have. And we came up with over 300 locations that needed uh, some sort of communication needs. So primarily fiber, it could be aerial, it could be underground. Um, so to start that process, here's the water department needs. Um, they're building out a SCADA system that is, you know, connecting the pump stations to the wells, to the water towers. Add to that parks department needs, they've got cameras, buildings, points of sales. INET needs, um, I'm just, you know, when you, when you combine all these different needs, like I said, 300 of them mapped. Um, the best way to, if you find the best way to connect them all by throwing them all on a map like this and then you overlay the, uh, the I'm on fiber to the home build maps, individual maps, and you try to figure out common pathways to take advantage of the cost savings. So that's been my life here <laughs> this last year. Um, once those are completed, you, you connect them up to a, uh, a backbone ring as shown here in red. Um, most of this has been built already. There's a southwest arterial section still missing. We've got a Sioux Green connection over on the, on the river side that goes north and south, but it'll be a, a, uh, a redundant backbone. So by joint building with this fiber to the home project, we are able to get the needed communication pathways installed at a much reduced pro price. So typical solo installation costs vary greatly by location, but on the west end it might be $15 a foot, in the downtown it can be up to $50 a foot to get the underground duct installed. That's usually the expensive part of a fiber network is actually getting the underground put in. Um, when adding to an existing project, this is reduced significantly. Uh, we're looking at under $10 uh, a foot. Um, there's also rubble and rock, you know, like water department, water towers are up on hills. They're, they're, a lot of times have rock. That, that can be $70 to $100 a foot if you have to bore through the rock. It, you know, you get to split that cost or depending on how many people are putting pipe in, you can divide it up. Um, we also are continuing to work on other private public communications projects as well. Uh, utilizing this dig once policy. Another outcome of uh, these private public partnerships is preserving the right of way. This slide lists some of the utilities competing for right of way room, and that room is, is very limited, especially in an older city like ours. Um, but we are going to run out of right of way. If each provider were to run their own duct separately, the conduits would end up very random and use up all the available space. Uh, by joint trenching and boring, uh, these ducts are all located within inches of each other, thus preserving the right-of-way. And the duct that we put in actually contains seven ind individual raceways, so we can get seven different providers in there. Uh, it also helps keep locates to a minimum during future construction in the area. In 2016, a group was formed at the city to help improve and promote growth of broadband and high-speed communications. Listed are some of the goals and priorities of that group. We still meet twice a month to stay focused on the needs of the city. And overall, this has moved broadband from a community and business negative to a positive. Uh, the process we developed has brought in additional providers to increase competition and investment while also providing opportunities for a robust city communications infrastructure. Back to traffic operations, here's the 2024 fiber and broadband capital improvement projects. Uh, moving on to the streets project, which is smart traffic routing with the efficient and effective traffic systems. We're government, we gotta have a nice acronym for it. Uh, this project is underway, it's a 30 month project. Um, and if all goes right, again, a little clarifier, we're, we're hoping to be complete in the spring of 2024. Uh, the video management system, the, the traffic engineering department also manages and maintains the traffic and public safety camera system. The goal is efficient use of the system by maximizing coverage and with minimal equipment. This accounts for more than 1,300 city-owned cameras, and when that's combined with the school and the county deployments, it totals over 2,400 cameras. It's used by a lot of different departments. Our goal or outcome is that each department is more efficient at their job. So one example of that is the police department's crime closure rate. Uh, we are nearly twice the closure rate of the national average, 
I think our number was, was 92. This year we're 94.75. We don't really have a, a national average calculated yet, but we're actually doing better. Um, we have one camera related capital improvement project this year listed here. Uh, there are many systems that are used in Harmony to keep our traffic signals operating efficiently. Um, Dwayne Richter has been instrumental in keeping these systems operated, operating and, and maintained. I thank you for that, Dwayne. I know it's been, <laughs> it's been a lot of stress. The following slides detail some of the upcoming capital improvement projects for 2024, along with a number of upcoming intersection improvements. To summarize, with the current private broadband investments happening in Dubuque, now is the best opportunity to partner and invest in the construction of these communication systems. These communication systems will be the backbone of all future technologies for the city. And the primary goal is to use these technologies to improve efficiency, reduce overall costs while providing better service to the citizens of Dubuque. So I'd now like to introduce Justine Hull, our newest traffic engineer, for a few follow-up slides on some of her tasks. Thank you, Dave. Um, good evening, Mayor and City Council members. I am Justine Hall. I am the other third of the traffic engineer staff. <laughs> um, so let's go to this. Um, in these few slides here, I just want to give some details of some traffic duties that may not be talked about or are talked about very smallly. So um, first off, our traffic staff and other colleagues in our engineering department are a part of the planning department's development review team. So with regards to traffic, we review traffic impact studies, signage, pavement markings, turning movements, driveway aprons, queuing, site distance, street lighting, and fiber. Very long list. Um, but that is across the board for any sort of development. That could be retail shops, that could be industrial centers, subdivisions. Um, and in this last year, we've had nine traffic studies that had to be completed and reviewed compared to three in 2021. Um, and these studies are required whether the development continues or not. Um, I'd also like to share some quantitative data re um, regarding our miscellaneous traffic items that we also deal with. So the first one would be right-of-way visibility issues. So this is when vegetation is in the sidewalk or in a parking lane over the roadway, in the alleys, or even covering up signage. Um, engineering and housing have been working on these types of requests, but since my position has been vacant for several years, that has been the job and a hard task for one of our engineering technicians, Troy Cress, which he has his own duties as well. Um, these visibility requests are not a small ask, and we have come up with multiple ways to efficiently um, do these processes for upcoming years. The next thing um, that I have on this slide is the um, traffic speed studies or vehicular volume data. This is completed by, uh, with respect to a citizen request or study areas that we're looking at or inquiring speed enforcement. Uh, we did 10 study areas this past year with our traffic counters that we do have. And <laughs> finally for traffic tonight, what everybody loves to talk about is temporary traffic control. Uh, over the past year, we have 40, proj 40 plus projects that have been funded by independent contractors that have requested right-of-way permits that need traffic control review. So that requires us to review that. So that takes some time and definitely the contractors are not traffic engineers, so they need some help with that. <laughs> um, so that review is required before that permit is approved. Um, that quantity does not include the temporary traffic control with city projects or any joint public partner projects that we have, um, like Dave was saying, with IMON or something like that. Um, the last thing, along with traffic control, engineering also gets notices about oversized vehicles, and sometimes the DOT uh, grants these routes and may not know about local traffic, so just a confirmation of those routes is always you know, nice to have as well. And I will give it over to Justin for facility management.
Thank you, Justine. Uh, good evening. I'm uh, Justin Hogan. I'm the facilities manager with the engineering department. Um, I also work closely with uh, Steve Brown, who provides assistance uh, on the project management side of uh, facilities. Um, the Office of Shared Prosperity and Neighborhood Supports finally moved in to their new home. Project went really well with a few supply chain hiccups, but uh, overall, the, uh, we were substantially completed with no major issues. Uh, the, I think the space turned out really well, and uh, it should serve their mission nicely. The uh, downtown facility study is in its final draft and will soon be ready to present to council. We had a lot of great input from all the departments involved in the study, and we should uh, have a great reference for plans for our future needs uh, for our city workforce and the citizens they serve. Also, the post office is currently planning to renovate their space and substantially reduce their, first, uh, their use of the first floor, which will give us more space and more options for future use for city offices. Our primary mission is to provide safe, accessible and comfortable facilities for, for staff to work as well as citizens to visit. We are focusing, pushing our facilities to be more energy efficient and making more technological advancements uh, and improvements such as climate controls and uh, electronic access. We service mainly the downtown buildings as well as provide technical assistance to other departments like the fire department and sustainability office. On our project management side, we have multiple projects for capital improvements. Uh, we also we handle uh, anything that has to deal with uh, facilities or maintenance uh, of those facilities. There's just a few projects, uh, roofing replacements, uh, federal building, which is our next, uh, uh, our main focus right now is our federal building renovation. Uh, we're working to update the climate systems uh, and make things more secure. Uh, also working to uh, improve the outside, a lot on the rear, including adding uh, electronic charging, uh, electric vehicle charging stations for the rear of the uh, parking lot, both uh, for city use and for uh, private use. And uh, I will turn my uh, turn it over to Steve Brown, which will give the uh, project management. Good evening, uh, Mayor and City Council. Um, I'd like to start with a just short clarification of the record. When Gus was going through our equity slides, I asked him to point out the photo of the embankment water slide from the B branch. Of course, that was an engineering department imagination that we worked with the MFC kids. And in talking with Brittany and Gwen, who ran the MFC summer progr step program last summer, that was unofficially voted the best activity of the whole step program. So I <laughs> wanted, wanted to make sure we got credit for that. So. Um, so again, project management, Justin and I are kind of a department of one or division one, but we work together and we work, I specifically work with a lot of help from other departments, uh, public works, sometimes wastewater, information services. Uh, and also on some of these projects, as you can see, my services sometimes go outside our department to help departments that don't often execute capital projects. So we jump around working on some parking ramp repairs, helping Willie O'Brien with uh, some SCADA upgrades for certain lift stations. Uh, Kearney Stout uh, is getting their roof restored in the springtime. We ran out of good weather in the fall, so that'll happen soon. And uh, Justin and I are working with the fire chief to uh, get some of the uh, conditions at some of the existing, their facilities upgraded. Uh, of course, Ryan Nucky earlier talked to you about uh, the smart parking and mobility plan. Uh, while Ryan and Russ do a lot with the parking and we work together, our department has a little bit bigger role on the mobility side. Uh, very important when it comes to equity. On our equity slide, we had the, uh, uh, the different uh, factors of poverty and of course transportation is one of those and that involves both bus, uh, parking sometimes and even if you park your car or drive a personal vehicle, you still get out and walk and that's where mobility comes into play. So. A uh, very important piece of moving downtown Dubuque uh, into the future to keep up with uh, modern things that other cities are doing. Uh, Schmidt Island Development, we have lots of exciting things going on out there. Our department is involved with the Yacht Basin lease. That's one of our, our lease locations. Uh, you'll hear later on from Gus how Bob Shizzle worked on the ice arena uh, as part of that. Uh, the, we're partnering as several city staff involved with the uh, DRA on the development plan for the island, which is an exciting project. And of course, the 
uh, amphitheater and the announcement of the Destination Iowa grant. So uh, very good. One of the photos, again, on our equity slide was of uh, we was summer, uh, sorry, uh, spring vacation here. The MFC kids, uh, the teens, came out to Schmidt Island last week. We did a half day uh, program with them where they became architects for the day and help us reimagine the island. So if you remember during our first presentation with the uh, smart parking mobility plan, we talked about we had almost 900 uh, online responses to the survey. Not a single person under the age of 18 responded to the survey. So us being able to work with the IJAG program in Temwa through uh, senior high school, Hempstead, uh, and then also partnering with Waller, and then being able to partner with the teens at the MFC, that's a very important aspect for our department to understand how they see mobility and how they get around. So interesting thing, we stopped by the skateboard park by the uh, softball fields, and we just asked them, you know, what could this space be? And one of the things more than one of them talked about is they don't feel safe in that space. And we're like, why is that? And they said, well, you know, maybe a car could come off the highway and hit us, so we'd like a big fence. But more than one teen said, I'm afraid someone's going to park their car in the highway, abduct me, and drive me to Wisconsin, which myself as an adult designer, that would have never entered my mind. But because we did that activity, we've learned that, and now we can deal with that as part of any reuse space planning. So again, the, these type of engagements with the teens are really important to get that, that type of perspective. Um, so they also did uh, very good. So got a lot of ex uh, activity uh, coming up on Schmidt Island. Uh, the Railroad Quiet Zone study, so this past week, uh, the Surface Transportation Board approved the merger of the Canadian Pacific Railroad and Kansas City Southern. Uh, that is expected by the railroad zone traffic projections to take train traffic in Dubuque uh, to almost 18 trains a day by 2027. Um, so as an engineering department, we'll be working to, again, leverage uh, the traffic center's intelligent traffic systems, try and figure out a way if we can push more information out to the public by leveraging our existing uh, broadband technology. And of course, uh, working on the RAISE grant to get 14th Street overpass. And again, as we always are, we're looking at other grant opportunities to create more separated grade pro crossings through downtown Dubuque to try and maximize convenience for the public. Uh, electric vehicle charging, so Ryan talked about a lot about the, uh, Ryan Nucky about the uh, bus chargers. So our department's helping with the installation uh, that Gina Bell in the sustainability office was able to get uh, Iowa DOT grant money for private charging, basically, or, or city uh, personal vehicle charging. So we did bid a project down at the Port of Dubuque ramp. Unfortunately, bids came in very high, so we've had to redesign that. But uh, we're finding, so what we what's proposed at the Port of Dubuque uh, ramp is called a fast charger, uh, and we're finding that uses a lot of power. So for instance, just this one charger posted will have its own transformer from Alliant Energy. Because it's a fast charger, it's drawing a lot of current. So uh, it's, we're definitely working towards proliferating charging opportunities around Dubuque and making them available for the public, but it does require some strategy. Uh, internally, uh, a bunch of us city staff from multiple departments including water, wastewater, public works, uh, sustainability office. Uh, we meet monthly to talk about renewable energy uh, initiatives and are we collaborating together to make sure we're working together and not against each other. Uh, that meeting's hosted by Dave Lyons from Greater Dubuque Development and just as he leads the uh, broadband team, that's a very successful project and it helps us network together as city staff and make sure we're working together. Who's getting electric vehicles, where are the chargers going? Are we planning to match departments with electric vehicles with uh, charging opportunities? So, and as Justin mentioned, there's a second, uh, Gina Bell was able to get a second grant for the uh, back of the federal building here. So it'll support both uh, city vehicle charging and it'll have a charging side available for the public. So if you're coming to Five Flags or the downtown, uh, there'll be a second location uh, and that we hope to get that in over the, the coming calendar year. Supply chain issues, extremely pro uh, program, problematic with charging. Some of the lead times on the port charging equipment was over a year out. So we're trying to redesign our approach to see if we can reuse certain uh, uh, capacity on site, but um, definitely a, a challenge, the supply chain. Uh, US EPA multi-purpose grant, this is something we received in 2019, and because of when COVID, timing of COVID, it never really got off the ground. Over the past year, we've made a lot of uh, good initiatives. Earlier this summer, we came in and Ryan Peterson from RDG Planning and Design and Jill Connors and I spoke to you about opportunities in the Southport. 
Uh, so this takes a look at, one of the things it does is reuse planning, lets us reimagine. We have several uh, local private partners interested in the South Port, so there's continued interest in redeveloping that space. Uh, we also have money through the, uh, the multi-use grant to do phase one and phase two environmental assessments. And we're gonna start, uh, we just reached a milestone with the US EPA getting our quality assurance plan approved, so now we can start working on uh, where those phase ones and phase twos will go to work in the downtown area. And we also have uh, cleanup money, two sites in the South Port and the third site identified in the grant is Comiskey Park, so that's more on the phase two part of the Comiskey Park project, but we'll be working on that. And then of course uh, our department and um, gets to work on the riverfront lease revenue. So here's the numbers for revenue uh, that have gone up. I would be remiss if I did not thank Anita Gagner in our office for keeping tabs of our almost 50 agreements. Uh, Anita's a, a great resource for us on the accounting side. Uh, she keeps track of all these things. She works with many of us staff on uh, grants. As a matter of fact, I was talking to her earlier this week and about the streets grant that Dave and Bob are working on and she said, yeah, I'm reconciling the grant and I'm off by three cents and she literally said, it's driving me nuts. Trying to, so as Darren and I work with her on B Branch and millions of dollars, we have a, a, a great faith in her ability, so really appreciate her help. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Gus to wrap it up. I think we're doing good on time, Corey. <laughs> 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 so uh, before I finish, I want to thank Nate Steffens for filling in for Assistant City Engineer Bob Schizzle that took ill today. So I want to thank Bob Schizzle and also uh, Chris Lyons for the next two projects I'm going to talk about, which is the riverfront dock expansion efforts. So uh, we are continuing to coordinate with multiple regulatory agencies to secure permit approvals to expand the existing riverfront docking facilities to accommodate large excursion boats in the Port of Dubuque. All the various federal regulatory agencies have been helpful and collaborative. However, a number of regulatory requirements are being mandated that the city complete prior to any permit for construction uh, will be issued. To comply with the regulatory requirements, it's not going to be an expedited uh, process because the river has been low and um, it's just presented some challenges in completing both the muscle survey and obtaining geotechnical river bottom borings along the shoreline where the proposed uh, dock facility is uh, going to be located. As a result, for the 2022 boating season, engineering staff had to pivot and change our game plan. Staff worked closely with the Viking, the American Cruise Lines, and the American Queen Steamboat Company to develop various docking configurations to ensure that multiple vessels would be able to be docked and utilize the River's Edge Plaza. The solution for last year was to um, basically place a spud, temporary spud barge offshore at the River's Edge Plaza, the Viking Mississippi, the American Duchess, and the American Symphony, and the American Queen all had made several stops at the Port of Dubuque last year. The collaboration worked and on September 4th, all four boats were actually in the port at the same time. So input from various boat captains right now have said that the spud barge offshore configuration at the River Edge Plaza worked extremely well last year, and staff is currently evaluating some similar options for the upcoming 2023 season. Uh, the final project that uh, engineering worked on last year, as you, you heard mentioned by Marie and several people, is the Dubuque Ice uh, arena settlement remediation project. The engineering part was very active in, uh, in that project and that occurred just last year. The arena was closed on uh, June 1st, like Marie said, and the first phase of work was to remove the existing ice rink, ice system, and a portion of the arena bleachers to allow for the installation of the deep foundation system under the rink area and throughout the main floor. The new deep foundation system comprised of <laughs> 473 deep compaction grout columns on approximately a 10 by 10 grid throughout the arena and lower main level to a depth of about 30 to 35 feet. So it was a big undertaking that took place in just a few short months. 
Once the settlement and the foundation system were complete, a concrete subfloor was installed and supported on the deep foundation system. Once the concrete subfloor was in place, a new refrigerated ice rink concrete floor was installed on the top and supported by a subfloor slab and foundation. Once the refrigerated ice rink was operational, the arena bleachers and seating were reinstalled along with the installation of new dasher boards and glass, along with the installation of new rubber sport flooring on the main level. This was all successfully completed and the Dubuque Ice Arena was reopened to the public in uh, November 2nd of 2022. Uh, this concludes the, our engineering budget presentation. I think it's record time. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody practiced several times this week and we got a certain amount of time for everybody. But before I conclude, I wanna express my appreciation for our outstanding efforts of our staff. Um, I'm truly blessed to be working with such wonderful people in our department and other departments of the city. I want to thank the city manager's office and the city council. Now, so if we have any questions, we'll be happy to try to answer them. Well, now you've given us at least an hour and a half to be able to ask you questions. So thank you very much, Gus. So Gus, Max, Darren, John, Nate, Dave, Justine, Justin, and Steve, thank you very much for, for that entire presentation. That was um, that was very helpful. We are in a public hearing to discuss the engineering department fiscal year budget uh, for 24. Do we have any public input on this item? Going once and twice, no. So we nobody here? No virtual. No virtual? There was written input submitted in the form of a letter signed by multiple homeowners facing South Grandview and Bradley Street, and that has been uploaded to this agenda item. Thank you very much, Adrian. Okay, then back to the table for discussion. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Jones. Just kudos on the presentation. I, I, uh, I love listening to you, Gus, but I, it was really neat how you divvied it up and gave us a glimpse at the expertise of the rest of the team. Yeah, I think it was Because it's, it's pretty impressive. It was important that everybody heard because everybody is really good and they're really engaged in their work. Well, you got a lot going on here and, and to present that in an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, hour and 12. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was counting our questions. Yeah, but yeah, hour count. 12. That doesn't count. I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Wethel, go ahead. I'm going to be a little careful on how I say this because I don't want to say that I thought engineers would be boring. But when I came to visit your department, I had a great time. I really appreciated everybody, their expertise. Um, I've, I've found this, and I've said this many times, there's, there's certain departments I have gone to, many throughout our city, that I feel that people are mission-driven in a surprising way. And your department is like that. You guys have a passion for doing it right. And it's impressive to me because it was clear the work that you do is of such a caliber that it truly saves our taxpayers money because we don't have to contract out certain services because we have the expertise in-house. You take your jobs incredibly seriously. You, without a doubt, um, just excel at what you do. So thank you, and I hope the citizens of Dubuque understand uh, the, the caliber of what you have. And thank you. Mr. Resnick. Thank you. I have a question for Mr. Ness, if you don't mind. Uh, and so uh, you mentioned that there is uh, capital expenditure uh, recommended, and it, it's listed here as uh, public safety camera installation. I was looking in the, um, in the capital. Uh, are you talking about the item just a street camera installation? I think that's what it is. Yeah, I believe it was. And is there, is there a name change? Uh, did you make a name change in that? To, I mean, it just says street camera installation starts this year at 30,000. Are this the 13 to 1400 cameras? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. And then it, it expands every year. Well, 110,000, 115,000. Is that just normal? Uh, that um, I, I, I think it's, I think it's, it, those bigger numbers keep getting pushed back a little bit. Um, we, we've got a number of locations that we have built underground to that, that, we would love to get cameras installed at, but we don't always have the funds to do it. So um, it's, it's, as you see, like with our, our ability to get the broadband and underground, con again, that's usually the most expensive part of even a camera installation is getting those conduits put in underground. Um, I know we had some on Locust Street that we'd been trying to do. 
And in some cases, you, 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 you don't want to always put them in underground because like there could be a storm sewer or sanitary sewer. I think Darren's got a storm sewer project that's going to be going up West Locust. So then you can, you, you can maybe put those funds towards the overhead uh, lines that uh, Imon's putting in and feed the cameras overhead. That, that is an option that just came up to us here recently. We think we're still working with them on that to see if we could do that. But it would, it would allow us to get these cameras in places that we've been trying to put them. I just didn't know, if, is there a number of cameras that is the ideal number that we're going for? If there's $100,000 <laughs> for the next three years, it sounds like there's going to be another 1,000 yeah. cameras or something. No. Just I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a moving target. And, um, and the reason that it's changed to change the name is, uh, did you? Uh, I guess if it was, I didn't do it on purpose. But I did pre-type all those in from, okay. if, if the name was slightly different, I apologize. But, Thank you. Yep. Mr. Mayor, I, I would just like to add, so the mayor and city council have adopted a policy about where to install cameras and it includes every city park, uh, every school, um, and the collectors and arterial streets in the community. So, you know, in the end, yes, the number could get quite high, but it's, it's gonna take a long time because besides putting in new ones, we have the existing ones, and I think it's about a every five-year cycle that we prefer, and we don't always hit that. And the five-year cycle is important for two reasons. One, so cameras don't keep failing, but the technology changes so dramatically, so quickly, that uh, they become so much more uh, useful with the new technology, even in the existing spots as we replace them. So we could, we could spend a lot more money on cameras to achieve our ultimate goal, which as I said, is the, all the parks and all the schools and our collectors and arterial streets. Thank you. Yeah, Sorry. Ms. Barber. So um, I, this is for Gus. I wanted to follow up with the letter that was um, shared with the staff in October from the group that is bordering South Grandview and Bradley Street there. Um, talking about the alley between Dunning Street and Randall, uh, which they are requesting um, a, a nice look at in terms of upgrading that alley, I guess is quite distressed. Um, and I know that your team is going to be there at Perry and Bradley to work on that lift station uh, this year as well, which is kind of in the same hood, if you will, just a block over. Uh, and I didn't know if there were some plans to kind of tie those two projects together and or even if this um, alleyway restoration or reconstruction is even on the schedule yeah i'm going to jump in for gus there so the only the only alley money we have is for in the b branch watershed and we have very little of that um at the back end of the 40-year plan for the b branch there is more dollars uh, designated mm -hmm. but we're nowhere near that point in time and we don't have any money budgeted for outside of that area, because remember the B branch is stormwater money. Sure. And um, with 240 alleys in the B branch, and I don't even know how many outside the B branch. And uh, the, before we started the B branch project, we didn't reconstruct any alleys. Mm -hmm. And so now what we try and do, just like we used to do, in the alleys we can't afford to reconstruct as we just try and do uh, minor maintenance to keep them so they can be traveled. The, every every uh, alley, everyone who abuts an alley does have the option to have an accessible alley project, mm -hmm. but it's 100% accessible okay. and there's no financial assistance from the city. Okay, because he describes it as, um, and thank you for that explanation, and I'll be happy to share that with uh, I think that we group. did send him a letter. Oh, you did? Okay, yes. good, because it looks like there's potholes and deterioration and other kinds of things. So, Okay, well, thank you for that yeah, I'm, communication. I'm sure we sent him a letter telling him that, what our yeah, policy we, was and what their assessment might be. So okay, we sent that right. last year. Yeah, that's what I had thought. I just wanted to touch base with yes. that. So, okay, and thank I, you. And I, I guess I probably ought to expand on that a little bit. You know, we have over 300 center line miles of streets. And so if you start talking about the driving lanes and the parking lanes, I don't know, John Klosterman, over a thousand lane miles maybe of streets. And it's tough keeping up with that. So then when you add all the alleys, if we were to start an alley program, it would take the money away from the streets 
that we can barely keep up with now. If it wasn't for the program that the council approved uh, years ago, where we have our own crews who pay between five and 10 miles of streets a year, we wouldn't even come close to keeping up because it's so expensive mm -hmm. to hire outside crews to do street and alley maintenance. Sure. Well, that's just good to know because I always seem to get those kinds of questions come my way because there's a lot of alleys in the uh, in these neighborhoods off of Grandview. So thank you for that, and I will be happy to share that information. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Quick, quick follow-up on that. Are, do, is that the way we assess sidewalks too? I, I don't, I don't remember that po the policy. Um, is it one hundred percent to the homeowner if the if a sidewalk needs to be rebuilt or S sidewalks? If they don't have sidewalks currently, they have to pay one hundred percent. But if they have a current sidewalk that needs to be rehabbed in some way, they still have to pay one hundred percent. Okay. It's, yeah. You know, there, so it's there, the same there's, thing. There's some cases yeah. where they they fall into low to moderate income that we do assist. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay. Well, I have a, I have a couple things here um, just on, on my list. Uh, first, just some comments. Uh, you know, we talked about, you know, questions that we get. Um, I, I'm sure, as you can imagine, a lot of the questions that come our way uh, seem to fall in the categories that you all work in. And you answered so many of them tonight. When are the JFK sidewalks starting? Uh, when is the east-west corridor starting? What's the timeline on this? Uh, the Viking docks. Uh, you know, what's going in with those? Um, you know, I heard about this bike trail going in here and there and all these different places. When are you putting that in? You answered some of those tonight. Um, why are you digging up my yard so much to put all this fiber in? And what's the benefit? You know, that's a really good answer on that one. Um, we've all seen that. And, and you're right about the patience, but it's really worth it. Um, and, I, you know, I still get people asking about the B branch. You know, why do we even do that? Or why are we still working on it? I mean, you see the pictures of cars floating down the street, and you get the quick answer on that one. Um, but the timeline for what that's going to be, I think, is really, really helpful to know. I'm also really struck by how much you talked about the future-oriented work that you're doing. This isn't just about fixing the potholes that are already there to keep it really simple, right? This is about looking ahead to see how can we get ahead of some of these problems. Um, Max, you're talking about you know what's under the streets in the in the sewer system and the things that we can do there. Um, you know, looking ahead with an eye not just on the infrastructure itself, but on sustainability, what the impacts are in equity. It's it's just. It's just incredibly impressive work. It, it really, really is. And I, I sincerely appreciate it. And I hope you, you know that, because a lot of the times I don't think you get the thank you. Um, but we really do appreciate all the work that you're doing on, this, uh, on a daily basis and, and all the, the challenges that come with it. I do have one quick question. And, and Darren, this is mainly for you. This is going to be about the water, um, the, the B branch pump, uh, gate and pump replacement. Because I know it's, it's, it's really disappointing that we weren't able to just move forward with that because we were all ready to go. Do you have a timeline for, you know, you mentioned two options. Do you have a timeline for what we're looking at as we, as we do that, as we start thinking about flooding again this spring, for instance? Yeah, so if we were going to design, redesign a smaller facility, the idea would it would probably take us a year to design, and then mm -hmm. we'd be able to move into construction. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and this, the larger facility that we had planned was probably a two-year uh, project in terms of construction. Mm -hmm. The smaller one, probably similar, maybe not quite as long, but similar. Um, in terms of, you know, we're... Like I said, we're still exploring funding options. We're still having discussions with, with the EDA, with the consistent grant about maybe getting an extension. To this point, they haven't been too agreeable. I mean, but we're still, you know, still keeping that alive. Um, but we're also looking at a couple other options that we would know maybe in the next uh, few months if, if we have another uh, funding source that could, you know, sure. replace that. And I know that's always difficult to try and extend some of those federal grants, but I wish they would in this case. I mean, especially in situations like this where we have things that have come in so much higher than what we, what we were looking for. Yeah. Um, I think that's very understandable by no fault of our own. Um, I, I just hope that we are able to continue to partner with them in that way because that would be very helpful. Okay, I think that's all the questions I had. Thank you very much for that, Darren. Okay. Well, look at us. It's like 925. I mean, this is a record not just for, for engineering, but it's a record for everybody else. I hesitate to ask my next question, but do we have anything else we need to discuss before tomorrow? Because we do have tomorrow, keeping that in mind. Uh, oh, Mike, go ahead. Yes? This would just be a reminder because it's a change in the schedule. Is tomorrow uh, the meeting's going to start at 545 instead of 630, and then we'll start with a session. Yeah. So we have a, we, we do on the a schedule tomorrow, we changed it um, pretty recently. 
Um, but we have, we're starting at 545, you said, tomorrow? Mm -hmm. At 545 yep. tomorrow, and we are going to begin with a closed session mm -hmm. and then start at 630 for mm -hmm. our regular meeting. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, with that then, thank you very much, everyone, for the presentation. And seeing no further business, we are adjourned.